Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to part three of Takeo After Dark, The Winter Essentials. Boy, oh boy, this is exciting. We're going to have another grand night. Uh, I'm really glad that you guys are here and uh, that you've decided to join us, you guys and gals. So I, uh, that's, uh, for everybody out there, uh, I'm John Barba from Takeo Comfort Solutions, and I'm joined by my two partners in crime, Rick Mayo in the West and Dave Holdorf in the East. How are you guys doing tonight? Don't all talk at once. If you all talk at once, we can't hear you. I was I was leaving it for Rick to go, so <laughs> he tries to jump in first. So uh, I'm doing great tonight. Doing really good. Uh, excited to be back for uh, for week three for three speeds. So That's I think right. we kind of, and believe it or not, we did not plan that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> that the discussion of three speeds was going to happen lucky. on week three. It was just I, I kind of planned it that way. <laughs> well. Rick, how's things out in Nevada? Nevada's good. Warm, 72 degrees. Actually uh, had a little nice little walk today and soaked up the uh, BTUs. And uh, I'm back in here ready to uh, talk about circulators and three speeds and, and see all, uh, well, I won't get to see, but uh, yeah, communicate with everyone here. So it's all good. Thank you. Excellent. Very good. Very good. And also joining us who are... We got two guys off screen, Tim Ward and John Messenbrink from our, our sponsors, Mechanical Hub. How are you guys doing this uh, fine evening? Awesome. Doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing terrific. Doing terrific. And what's, uh, what's the big news with Mechanical Hub this week? What have you guys got going online that people should be checking out? Hey, I want to pop on screen here. There, there I he am. is. There he hey, is. everybody. This is John. Uh, I have a face for webinars, as you can see. So, uh, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, we just got a lot of good stuff uh, on the site and through our social media channels, uh, mechanicalhub.com and plumbingperspective.com. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, just a, a good friend and a fellow editor in our industry, Bob Mater, uh, passed away on Monday night. I don't know if any of you had met him. I know you guys have, John and Dave and Rick, and he was just a a gentle giant. He was my mentor in the industry at Trade Press. So just wanted to say, you know, I'm really sorry to his, his family and friends and, you know, but uh, we'll we'll carry on and make him proud, you know, doing the best we can in, in uh, trade journalism. So very good. he was a very kind gentleman. I, I He was always just very nice. It just the epitome of a nice person. You know, I, yep. I, I let's raise a glass to Bob. Good, yep. good, Godspeed, Bob. Thank you for all of your contributions and, and best, you know, we'll meet again till we meet again. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So well, excellent. Well, yeah. Good luck with the show tonight. Uh, thanks again for everyone joining in. It's going to be a really good show. So thank you. Thanks awesome. you guys. Thanks for Mechanical Hub and, and hosting and working all that, your stuff in the background too. So very good. Let's all rock right. and roll. Let's rock and roll. All right, let's get to work tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about three-speed essentials. And no, not the Schwinn Stingray, although that remains to this day the coolest bike ever. My 11-year-old self wanted nothing in the world more than a Schwinn Stingray three-speed. Didn't get it, but that doesn't mean I couldn't, didn't want it. I'm going to get one someday. I'm Before, I, before I'm gone, I'm going to get that bike. I'll tell you right Did you now. have a sissy bar? I did not have a, I, what I did was I had an old, I, I, instead of getting me that bike, my parents got me a Rambler, a Columbia Rambler with twin baskets in the back, oh. which was their way of saying, we're going to send you to school to get beaten up. Okay. Yeah, I, I imagine. <laughs> I saved my paper route money and I bought a pair, I bought a set of monkey bars and a banana seat. And I'm, I didn't get the, the sissy bar in the back didn't go up really much higher than the one in the picture you see there. Uh, okay. So. Instead of being a completely lame looking bike that would get me beat up, it looked like a really lame attempt to make a lame looking bike look cool that basically got me beat up and got my bike taken away. So that's that's that was the lesson of my life. Just, you know, <laughs> if you're not going to get the bike you want, walk. That's all there is to it. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about three speed circulators tonight, guys. We're going to talk about three speed circulators and they do still have a place in our world. Everybody gets all excited about ECM, 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 variable speed this and variable speed that. Um, but it still remains a three-speed world out there in, in many cases. And three-speed circulators uh, are, are, are like any other circulator, variable speed or fixed speed, is you still got to know what you're doing. You still got to know how to figure flow. 
you got to know how to figure head and you got to be able to select the right pump curve and there are going to be instances where the three pump curves on that three-speed circulator none of them are right i mean they may cover the require the flow and head requirements but the shape of the curve might just be the wrong thing to do so you shouldn't use that we're going to go over all of that stuff tonight on three on uh, in our in episode three three speed essentials. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes just before we get started. Again, uh, just so so we're all together. Your expanded control panel. Uh, make sure that the uh, orange arrow is is pointing in the right direction. You can expand your control panel. You've got your audio selections right there. So make sure um, you know that that that's in the way that you wish. There's a handout section, and we have three handouts for you tonight. Uh, so make sure you download those, and they're just uh, things to, to to keep. And you'll get you'll get a, a real good look at one of them in just a couple seconds. So you've got your handout section. All you do is just click on that, and you'll download each individual file. And then for questions and chat, you got that bottom section right there. So what I would like y'all to do is just type in a little hi, hello, how are you? Looking good. Love the T-shirt. This is our Takeo After Dark T-shirt, man. Just so I know that you you guys can hear me. All right, great, excellent. I see a ton, just a ton of people already coming, and that's beautiful. Thank you. Good. Now I know at least you can hear me. <laughs> that's the most important thing. All righty, and if you're on a phone or tablet, okay, if you're on a phone or tablet, here's how it works. You got those little controls down at the bottom. All right, your screens uh, for your webcam and your presentation, that's on the bottom left. Uh, your audio settings, attendees, that's not enabled for, for your case. And then for questions, obviously, it's just the question mark. You click on the, that thing and you can type in your uh, type in your uh, uh, your question. So cool, 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 cool. We're all on board. Now, that one more thing, and just so you know, one more thing is going to play a role this evening. One more thing. I want to announce for our St. Patty's Day uh, Takeo After Dark whoop de doo That's going to be March 17th, all right, for our St. Patty's Day extravaganza. We're kicking this off tonight. We're looking for your best job site tips, tricks, shortcuts, job site hacks, Whatever you do to that, whatever you do that's that, that that you think you know the rest of us could certainly benefit from that that helps you get your jobs done better, faster, quicker, easier, etc. Please share them with us because we're going to sift through all of the uh, all of the uh, um, app entries uh, and we're going to share the best ones on our March 17th uh, uh, winter session finale, which is going to be the tips and tricks and job site uh, hacks essentials. So we're going to do that's going to be Wednesday night, March 17th. OK, and what you're seeing here is that some of the prize packages, I mean, you're going to uh, we've got some pretty cool stuff. Uh, Dave, why don't you go over the prizes? Because you've got them like sitting right behind you. Don't you're right there. Swag They're right man. there. Swag man. man. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got my hands on it early. So the, the last class of the winter session is all about you guys. And if nobody submits anything, we're not doing a class. Hey, we're just drinking. <laughs> and I, get keep, I, get to, I get to keep all this stuff then all right i want to send this stuff out so i've got ourselves a nice yeti cooler i've got a, a carhartt tool bag up there we've got the coffee mugs hats i got a job site speakers t-shirt all that jazz is going to you guys going to somebody so i want to get rid of it so um so send us or share or put it on instagram put it on facebook Make sure you tag one of us. Make sure if you're if you're not on either one of the social medias or don't want to put it there, that's fine. Send me an email. I'm gonna send it out uh, in the chat section. Um, so you can so um, send me an email and we're going to use it in the last class. So uh, we're gonna try and use as many as we can, obviously, in the last class. And then what happened? Who wins this? Is the best tip, trick, hack, whatever it is voted by you guys Very all cool. right not going to be voted by us all right we don't we're not going to pick who gets it you guys we're going to put a poll up based on the ones that were used and which was the best one so um take this stuff please out of my house i don't want it i <laughs> want somebody here to take it so uh so do that we're going to share this also across social media and emails and stuff so you're going to hear about it then too but you guys got first dibs. We haven't told anybody else yet except for you guys that are here tonight. So thank you. All right, very good. So that's the big deal. So make sure you get the, what uh, in the download section, I just, I took a, a picture of this slide for you. So you can just download that so you can see 
the the what you need to tag on Instagram, etc. So uh, cool, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. You get actually one of these T-shirts that I myself am wearing tonight. It's not going to be this particular one. You'll get one that no one else has worn because that would just be gross. But we we've got T-shirts, we've got the stickers, we've got all this cool stuff that. that Dave has. So that's very, a walking cool. billboard there. Yeah, heck yeah, I baby. Love it. Heck yeah. All righty, gang, let's get this show on the road. Let's start talking about three-speed circulators. We already had one question come in from Jeremy Nash. Are there any flat curve options when dealing with three-speed pumps? I've run across mainly steep curve. Uh, if there is, what are the options? Primary and zone valve systems. Thank you. Jeremy, you are reading my mind, my man. Yeah, we do have a three-speed 0010. It's kind of a service pump. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but just so you know, you, you, you're kind of on, on board with it now. The Taco 0010 is a flat curve three-speed circulator, or it's you, specifically the 0010 three-speed because we have a 0010 single speed as well. But it's a flat curve circulator kind of designed to be a replacement for the B&G 100s, the Taco 110s those pumps and we'll, we'll get a look at that curve later on but good great question and a good thing to get us started excellent why do you use three speed circulators uh, i did a, a presentation in toronto gosh it's got to be 10 12 years ago now and canada is is a three speed nation um and i asked the group why do you use three speed pumps give me your reasons i i mean because they can only run one speed at a time right it's click 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 one it's either speed one two or three or low medium and high or whatever you call it why do you use three speed pumps and these were some of the answers that were given to me that day in toronto first one hey makes pump selection easy i just use this one because this is the only pump i'll ever need it's got three speeds which is two better two speeds better than one speed so it just makes pump selection easy. I use this one all the time. Cool. It begs a bunch of other questions, but that's cool. I like this one. Hey, it's a really good value. I get a, I get three speeds for the same price as a single speed. That's a better deal. <laughs> okay. That's a better deal. Again, it can only run one speed at a time. Okay. And someone has to manually change it. But it seemed to, to several people in our audience that it was a better deal. There was a better value. I get, I get three speeds for the price of one. Anytime you can get three of anything for the price of one, it's kind of attractive. Okay, so that was a kind of a, that was a common question. My favorite was this one. Why do you use three-speed pumps? Because you don't make any four-speeds. If you made a four-speed pump, I'd use that sucker. Okay, That's a, that may have been my favorite answer. That may have been my favorite answer altogether. So I followed that up with, how do you know which speed to use? Which was a much more difficult question because you out there know as well as we know. And I'd like if you if type in your type in your answer. Where are these things 99.7 times out of 100 actually set? What speed do you usually see three speed circulators set to almost all the time? Yep, based on yet yeah, high speed all the time, all the time. It's it's called contractor no callback mode. So it kind of makes the point of having three speeds kind of moot, right? It, yeah. It's it, if you if you if you have a three speed pump and you always set it to high, you don't have a three speed pump. Okay, you just don't. But that's you know that's just the way it is. Now I we we did get some interesting responses as to how they 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 did select speed that weren't just, well, I just set it to high and get the hell out of there. Some of my favorites were, well, I started it high and if it makes noise, I turn it down until it stops making noise. All right. There's a guy who's in tune to velocity. Okay. Very good. I started it high and I turned it down until it stops making noise. <laughs> Honest to God, we got this one too. I started it low and then I turn it up until it starts making noise. That way I know it's working. Okay. I like that one. My favorite was this one, and this is a legit, honest-to-God answer. Uh, if it's if it's a gas boiler, I turn it to high. If it's an oil boiler, I turn it to low. And regardless of fuel, if it's on an indirect, I set it to medium. I couldn't figure that one out to save my life. Where the where the logic was behind that, but it made sense to this person. So great. <laughs> okay. If it's a gas boiler, set it to high. If it's an oil boiler, set it to low. And if it's an indirect, set it to medium. I 
That sounds like a guess to me, but but that's the way it is. Now, the best answer, of course, is this one. After careful calculation of flow and head, I select the speed which has the pump curve that best covers the requirements of each job. Of course, I didn't get that answer that day in Toronto. And in all the years I've been doing this, I've maybe gotten that answer once or twice. All right. So the mystery of three speed circulators is I just set it to high and get the heck out of there. All right. That's no callback mode. I know it's going to work. We're good. It's a guess. It's a guess. <laughs> and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the great Sherlock Holmes mysteries, uh, is quoted. You know, Sherlock Holmes said, I never guess. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist the facts to suit the theories instead of the theories to suit the facts. I love that quote a lot on so many levels, but that's kind of the way it is. That's why I, I turn it to high. How do you know it's the right one? Well, it works. That's twisting the facts to suit your theory, right? It works. Yeah, it works. Yeah, no, if, if again, if it goes back to that whole notion of nobody's freezing to death and blaming me, therefore it must be right, all right? It must be correct. No, we have we have other hurdles to 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 cut to to clear beyond nobody's freezing to death and blaming me. We want efficiency. We want comfort. We want long life. And as we've talked about in our series over, you know, if you've been to more than one Takeo after dark, you know how we feel about this. The circulator has more to say about the overall efficiency, performance, uh, lifespan, economy of operation, etc., of the system as a whole than we've ever given it credit for because that's one of the things variable speed circulators have opened up for us, the, uh, the ability to see and experience and understand how flow really impacts what the boiler does, okay? So yeah, you know, you set it to high, nobody's freezing to death, but it might not be the right thing to do, okay? In the big picture for your customer. It's convenient, but it might not be right. So we had a lot of questions last week and I wanna to get to it this week. If we're going to figure out how to how to set up an ECM circulator, if we're going to think about how to set up a uh, a, uh, um, a three speed circulator, or if we're trying to pick the right single speed circulator, it starts here. Do the math. It won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. Okay. It won't hurt you. Bunnies, puppies, and kittens will live if you do the math. Okay. They'll live if you do the math. We start with the universal hydronics formula. This is how we find the gallons per minute flow rate a circulator needs to deliver, all right? The universal hydronics formula states that GPM is equal to BTUH divided by the product of delta T times 500. Let's define those terms. GPM, of course, is gallons per minute. It's the flow rate you need in order to deliver the BTUs required, the flow rate you need to deliver the BTUs required. BTUH, of course, is the BTUs required. If it's you know a single pump for a single zone, it's the BTU load of the zone. If it's a pump for a zone valve system, it's the BTU load of the entire system. And we design for the, the design conditions, the worst case scenario, quote unquote, coldest day of the year. All right, so there's your BTUH. That's the numerator. The denominator is delta T times 500. Delta T is your designed for temperature drop of the fluid as it goes through the system. Again, we typically design North American hydronics to a delta T of 20, okay? Meaning the water goes out at 180, comes back at 160. We have an average of 170. Uh, if you go with a lower, bo lower temperature boiler, ModCon, maybe the water's going out at 140, comes back at 120 average water temperature of 130. It's the delta T we design for. There's no magic around 20. Uh, it's a convenient number because 20 times 500 is 10,000 and you can divide anything by 10,000. The point here is we want to try, when we select our circulators, it's, it's at a goal of making sure that delta T stays as wide as possible for as much of the, of the heating season as possible in order to enhance efficiency. 500 is a mathematical constant. That comes when we use 100% water, all right? It comes from multiplying the weight of one gallon of water, 8.33 pounds, times the number of minutes in an hour, that's 60, times the number of, uh, uh, or times the specific gravity of the fluid, which is one for 100% water, times the specific heat of the fluid, which is also one. One BTU to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit in one hour, okay? 8.33 times 60 times 1 times 1 is 499.8. Eh, we'll call it 500. 
all right? Now, glycol changes that, okay? The more glycol you put into a system, that 500 number starts to drop. It might drop to 470, 460, 450. It depends on the mixture and the brand that you use. There's no, uh, there's no industry standard. It just depends on who's you buy and what's the mixture, okay? So they'll have that on the jug and you'd have to actually math it out. But 50-50 uh, glycol solution, Rick, what, what's the lowest you've seen a 50-50 glycol solution number? I'm thinking That's about 450. around 450. Yeah, right, right around 450. That and 5050 glycol, you'd be using that in a snow melt system. Okay. Usually it's it's at 70 water, 30 glycol, 80, 20, something like that. That'll keep you to they'll take care of you so the system doesn't freeze up. All right. So there's your flow portion of the equation. Then there's the head loss. And I'm going to show you two ways for head loss. This is the estimating way, the estimating way. When you're in somebody's house and it's six o'clock or five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and you gotta get them a pump and you're trying to figure out the head loss of this zone or whatever it is, it's the length of the loop. And we're gonna define the length of the loop as the, the, the pipe that uh, starts on the outlet side of the circulator, goes all the way through the system and back to the inlet side of the circulator. That's yep. your, your measured length. All right. And you're going to estimate this when you're in someone's house. You're going to estimate this as best you can. It's not a guess. You don't want to guess, but you want to say, hey, if I was pipe, what what route would I take to get through this house for this particular zone? And you don't have to be exact. Uh, Dave, Dave, you have some great advice on this uh, in terms of estimating that length. Oh, never. The, when you estimate the length, it should never end in any other number but a zero or a five. Right. <laughs> That's right. That means you're spending way too much time estimating the length of pipe it is. All right. You're just going to say, hey, you know what? It's perimeter heat with baseboard. The length of this house is 40 feet. Well, that's 40 feet of pipe. All yep. right. If you take out a tape measure, you're spending too much time doing it right now. Yep. It's just an estimate. It's just an estimate. So you estimate the, the, to the length. And then you want to allow for valves and fittings and stuff that's in the way because valves and fittings and stuff that's in the way has pressure loss that's equal to certain lengths of pipe. A three quarter inch copper elbow, for example, has the same pressure drop as two and a half feet of straight three quarter inch pipe. All right, uh, a, a, a 45 is one, is one foot of pipe, uh, et cetera. So you, you, you can't count them, so you allow for them and we do this by adding 50% to the length. So whatever that estimated length is, you just multiply it by 1.5. And that gives you your total developed length. Lastly, to estimate the head, you're going to measure, you multiply that total developed length by 0 0.04. 0 0.04, and that will give you an estimated head loss or pressure loss of the of the fluid as it goes through the piping system. Now, why 0 0.04? 0 0.04 represents four feet of head loss for every 100 feet of straight, properly sized pipe at the maximum flow rate for that size of pipe. That's a very key phrase right there, at the maximum flow rate for that size of pipe. So for example, if we're if it's a three quarter inch copper pipe zone, the maximum flow rate through three quarter inch copper pipes, four gallons a minute. That's how we're estimating the head loss. So it's length times 1.5 times 0 0.04. If you wanna shorten that sucker up a bit, little mathematical magic here, 1.5 times 0 0.04 equals 0 0.06. So you could take the shortcut and simply multiply the length by 0 0.06, but at least now you know why 0 0.06 is 0 0.06. Yes, okay? and, and Bill just com commented on that too. He was saying, you know, um, you know, hey, make that math step one less, one easier. And right. I agree, but if you don't know where the math comes from, then it's a mystery. Yeah, yeah I, you want to never know where it really comes yeah. from. So I'm always a proponent. If you're gonna do a shortcut math method, you have to understand where that math comes from. So yeah, 0.06 right. is just like, uh, yeah, just because I told you so. So yeah. 1.5 times 0 0.04. Do it on your do it on your calculator real quick. You'll see it's 0 0.06, and you will not harm a puppy, kitten, or a bunny. All right, so no puppies, no kittens, no bunnies were harmed in the uh, in the in the production of this presentation by the way too all right rodney's got a question yeah i'm sorry go ahead and, and rodney's got a question that you might be covering already and just saying hey it works for copper but what about pecs 
So are you going to show both, or are you just going to show? Uh, I'm just going to show one. copper here, but I get after after the presentation, I'll dig out the PEX pressure loss chart. With PEX, the best thing to do is to go right to your PEX manufacturer's pressure loss chart, and yep. what they will give you is the pressure loss in feet of head per foot of pipe at different flow rates. All right, and you just simply multiply the feet of head by the by the foot of pipe. Okay, by how many feet of pipe you have in that run. One thing um, to remember, though, don't. If you're using a radius elbow, don't count that as an elbow. Right. You right. don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. The the benefit of PEX is that you don't have to use all that many fittings, you know, yeah. and you 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 you're better off not using as many fittings. But the PEX manufacturer will will publish a pressure loss chart for the different sizes of pipe at different flow rates. And it, it sometimes it gives you pressure loss per foot. Uh some I've seen some that give you the pressure loss per 100 foot. You know, it's the same thing, only different. Uh, but then just a little bit of mental math, and that will give you the head loss. All right. I got um, a, another question came in from David um, uh, Column before. Is this only for baseboard? No, this is anything that's got your hard pipe in it. Yeah. You know, anything mm -hmm. that you're piping up right now. So it's um, the delta T is going to change based upon your heat emitters that you're doing. Um, you know, if you were doing fan coils, you know, you want to know what the pressure drop or the, or not the pressure drop, but the temp drop design of your fan coil is, which would change the universal hydronics formula. So not just for baseboard, but we do know baseboard is a, is a good chunk of stuff out there. Um, also I want to make a comment to, uh, to a buddy of mine, Harry, that's on tonight, dude, this part is what I wanted to talk to you earlier about right now. So pay attention. <laughs> here. <you go. laughs> right. Hey guys, excellent questions. Great. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Clark, um, keep track of them too. I'm paying attention to the question. So that that deals with, you know, other stuff that I have down in my basement to give away tomorrow. So Oh one yeah, the, that's right. Of, that's right. We forgot to mention that. The good you know, the, the 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 engagement, great questions, all that stuff go that's gonna help you tonight. Uh in if with uh with, with what we have to give away. What are we giving away tonight, Dave? You got the t shirts, the, the stickers. Um, yeah, I got some T-shirts, and I also have one of the, some some of these tool bags too, filled with goodies. Ah. So what I what I'll do is I got. Uh, <laughs> I wish I was in the audience, man. I wish I was yeah. in the audience. So, so what I what what I'm going to do is we're going to at tomorrow. Um, I go through all the numbers and all the stuff that comes down, and I kind of randomly pick six winners. All right, and then one of them's the grand prize winner. And it, it's all random stuff that I'm picking from. Um, so I'm, I'm choosing more than what we did last year or, or earlier. We did just, you know, you got one winner a, a week. So doing a little bit more, I got more stuff to give away this year. Very good. Hey, uh, Todd Raymond actually mentioned there's a, 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 in your downloads, we have the, uh, I think we have the Takeo heating products catalog or the Takeo products catalog, right? Yes. That, that's in the download section, right, Dave? Correct, it is. Should be. Page 44, you'll have a PEX pressure loss chart. That's right. Okay, very good, very good. So you can download that right now. You don't even have to look up the PEX manufacturer's chart. We got it right here. <laughs> hey, one, right, of the now, things, one of the things that David might have been clarifying, though, um, is I'm just anticipating he was talking about like a radiant application. Now, this will help you on the supply and return out to the manifold location, but you need the information based on the manifold, what the links are and the flow per loop and all that stuff. So right. maybe that's what he was getting at, that, uh, hey, if I got a big long loop that's covering a big area with high flow, it's going to be probably more than that number we're giving you. So you you make a good point. So. Yep. Yeah, I mean, with the, you know, we we can certainly at the at the end of this presentation we can do a rating example. I think that we 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 have the we have the stuff in we have the presentation set aside, so we can certainly do that if you guys want. But let me get to the copper. All right, this is uh this comes from the Copper Tube Handbook, uh, published by the Copper Development Association. Just go on go in your search, just Google uh, Copper Tube Handbook, and you'll you'll get a link to the PDF here. Um, Table six is a pressure loss of water due to friction for types K, L, and M copper at different flow rates. This brings flow rate into the equation as well as pipe size and pipe type. And this gives you your PSI per linear foot of tubing. So uh, you, you'll find it's, it's this is the pressure loss in PSI for one foot of pipe. Now you multiply that by the total length of the pipe, and that gives you the pressure loss in PSI uh, for that total length. To convert that to feet ahead, you multiply by 2.31. 1. 
Why 2.31? As we've said before, a column of water 2.31 feet high will have a gauge pressure at the bottom of one PSI. And also now to remember, just to reiterate, we are dealing, of course, with closed loop systems. Closed loop systems, we don't lift the water. We don't care how high the water has to go. It's already filled, it's already pressurized. We're just making her go round and round, okay? Like the motor on a Ferris wheel. Open systems, a little different. Closed systems, we don't care about the lift, okay? So good, we're, we've got the basics down. Let's uh, let's take a look at a couple things. Here are the, here's a um, pump curve charts for the Taco 0015 three-speed. And you know, for Jeremy, there's the 0010 three-speed, okay? Yep. In red, flat curve, high flow, low head, flat curve three-speed circulators the 0015 lower flow higher head steeper curve circulator um the, the 0015 shares a very similar performance set of performance curves with the grunfus 1558 the bng nrf 22 uh armstrong's three-speed pretty much anybody's three-speed out there they're going to be almost identical in terms of performance uh, performance curves. I mean, close enough to that that they're they're indistinguishable from one another in terms of the curves. Okay, the shape of the curves. Whoop. Sorry, going backwards here. There oh, we go. No. There we are. All righty. So those are the the three speeds we're going to be talking about today. What I want to go through is how do we know what speed? So we're going to say, all right, say I got a big honking zone of fin tube baseboard. Just a big old honking zone of fin tube baseboard or panel radiator, or anything you're gonna be, that, that that has a lot of BTUs on it, okay? Radiant's gonna be a little different because we're dealing with uh, long runs of PEX, but just uh, this could this could be a, a, a high BTU load going through an air handler. This could be a high BTU load going through radiators, you know, cast iron baseboard, cast iron radiators, anything in a series loop at this point, that is what we're gonna be referencing here. So fin tube is, is simply just the example that we're using. So if I got a really, really, really big zone of fin tube baseboard, man, don't I need high speed? That's when I'm going to need high speed, right? Well, let's figure that thing out, okay? Let's say I've got a zone of 30,000 BTUs. Now, I don't know about you, but 30,000 BTUs to, to this cowboy is a pretty big zone. All right, there are yeah, there are bigger zones, yeah, but 30,000 BTUs, let's think about it. I, I mentioned this, I think it was last week. My house, old house in Minnesota was 2,400 square feet in Minnesota, all right? Minnesota, where it gets down to 15 below for a design temperature, outdoor design temperature. House was not anything special. It was built, it was built in uh, the late 70s. It was not super insulated or anything like that. Any, not anything, not out of the ordinary for that uh, part of the country. The total, the total load of that house was 44,000, okay? So th think about that, 30,000 BTUs, big honking zone in reality. Yep. yep. That comes out to about, let's say, 80 feet of baseboard, okay? Or however many feet of cast iron baseboard, however many panel radiators, whatever we have in series here. But we're going to presume 80 feet of baseboard in this example with a total run of 160 feet. That's the run from the outlet side of the circulator all the way through the house, through that baseboard, and back to the inlet side of the circulator. All right, 160 foot of total run. I think by and large, we can all agree that's a big zone. All right, that's a big zone. Are there bigger zones? Yeah, this is a big zone. Okay, this is a big zone. Let's do some math now, okay? To figure out our flow rate, it's BTUs divided by delta T times 500, in this case, 30,000 divided by 20 times 500 or 10,000. 30,000 divided by 10,000, it's three gallons a minute. Three gallons a minute ain't a lot, but it's three gallons a minute. But what about the pressure loss, man? That's three gallons a minute going through 160 feet of pipe. All right, well, let's, let's do it the easy way first. 160 feet times 1.5 divided by 0.04, that's 9.6 feet ahead, not quite 10 feet ahead, 9.6 feet ahead. So that's going to be right there, right there. Yeah. From the looks of it now, low speed's kind of out of the question, isn't it, on the 0015? Low speed's not going to get her done. We're probably going to have to look at medium speed. High speed's way, way too big. It's way bigger than we need it to be. So we're not even looking at high speed now. Medium speed will work here and work just fine. In fact, if I was using the 0010, 
even though that green dot is slightly above my medium speed, I'd probably set that thing to medium because it's going to work just fine all every day of the year, except when it's absolutely the coldest out. And if, was there any fudge built into the, my, my BTU load? Probably a little, probably a little. If we were dead on accurate with everything, the worst thing that would happen here if I used medium speed on the 0010 is that under design conditions, under the when it's the coldest day of the year, my Delta T might not be 20, it might be 22. And that's no, that's not a bad thing at all. As long as I got the BTUs in the boiler to deliver them, if I my, my Delta T goes out to 22, no harm, no foul. That's not a bad thing. So in that example, that's how I would interpret that green dot with the red curves, okay? That green dot with the red curves. Now, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Here's the system curve. All right, I'm going to plot out hey, the John, system. Here. Yeah. Let me. Can you go back a slide? Surely. All right. So we have a typo on the screen. Yeah. A we couple do. guys caught that. <laughs> you, you did the 160 times 1.5 divided by 0.04, which is supposed to be at times. Right. Row. Row. That's okay. So a couple row. people pointed that out. So excellent, Jeremy. And, and yeah. uh, who else got in there? Travis said that. And and Josh got in there, so thanks, guys. So and here's what I like to do. This was in, this was completely intentional. <laughs> I like to put these little things in there just to make sure you guys are paying attention. So every one of you guys, you get a gold star, man, because that was completely on purpose. All of a sudden, your nose is getting really <laughs> big, man. <laughs> no. Every all the you know what this says? Everybody needs an editor. Everybody needs an editor. All right. Well. Now, we talked about system curves last week, right? Well, just plotting out the rest of the system curves, and you're going to see where those red dots are. Those are the points of intersection of this system curve on, uh, on, um, on, on, uh, on the different 0015 uh, performance curves. So if I went with low speed, I'd be at 2.7 GPM at 7.5 gallons a minute. And you know what? Again, most of the heating season, low speed is going to work just fine. And we may actually see, even under design conditions, if we have the horsepower in the boiler, I think we'd probably be okay. Yeah. I think we'd probably be okay that just Delta T might get out to 25, maybe 28 degrees. No not a bad deal. thing. No. You know, not a bad thing at all. So there's a case to be made here for going to low speed in this example. If I went to medium speed, all right, you can see my flow rate would be three and a half gallons per minute, and I'm at about 12 and a half feet ahead. With as a zone pump, the head, the, not, not a big deal. Uh, and if I go to high speed, I'm at almost four gallons a minute at about 14 feet ahead. Now, if I use medium or high, is this thing going to work? Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Close enough, right? Close enough. It'll work. It'll work. Uh, but we can ice, but there's, there's the cost. There's the price that you do pay here. You will be paying a price. It's not electrical consumption. It's actually in Delta T. You're going to pay for this in Delta T. So, you know, BT, GPM equals BTUH divided by Delta T times 500. That's an algebra formula, right? Remember you said nah, in school, I'm never using algebra ever. This is a waste of my time. <laughs> well, today's the day. I'm sorry. We're going to use algebra. Uh, because it's an algebraic formula, we can now isolate for Delta T. And this delta T equals BTUH divided by the GPM I'm using to deliver it, divided by 500. Let's fill in what we know. Uh, if I'm, I'm at high speed, okay, 30,000 divided by about 3.8 GPM divided by 500. That's telling me my best delta T is going to be 16 degrees. Under design condition, that quote unquote coldest day of the year, the best I'm ever going to see is 16. Is that bad? No, it's not bad. It's not 20 but it's not bad, but it's gonna start that short cycling cycle, if you will, all right? The best we're ever gonna see is 16. We'll never see a 20 in that, in that mechanical room. If I went to medium, I'm a little bit better, okay? I'm a little bit better. We're at about 17 degrees, okay? So yeah, is it okay? Will it work? It's gonna work. I, that's what I was thinking. I said it to high, it works. Okay, yeah, it works, but we're paying for it. That boiler is going to short cycle. You're not going to have as much efficiency. And as it gets warmer out, that delta T is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's just the way it goes. All right. So an, ex an excellent question came in from Dan Cook a little while ago. And I said, let's hold off on that. 
So he says, can we review? Does the Delta T stay the same for the system or does it vary with the BTU requirements throughout the season? This question comes up a lot for him. Mm -hmm. All right. And so yes, these numbers that John is showing you right now is based upon design day. Yeah. This is the best it would ever do. As it warms up outside, that Delta T is going to shrink. Yeah. And why does that Delta shrink? Delta T shrink because the BTU load shrinks, but the flow rate stays the same. Yeah. So That's it's 50% right. load, okay, instead of 30,000 BTUs, we're at 15,000 BTUs, but we're still delivering 15,000 BTUs with 3.8 GPM. Yeah. If you do that math, you'll find that your Delta T is going to be eight. Eight. Yeah. And we spend wow. 50, I think we spend, what is it? We spend 50% of the heating season at one third load or less. All right, one third load or less. So we're going to spend half of the heating season, maybe a little more than half of the heating season with Delta T's less than five. All right, you want to know why boilers short cycle? That's why boilers short cycle. Okay, that's why boilers short cycle. And as we said, that's only an estimate. Okay, that's not reality. That's an estimate. It's only an estimate. And boy, you, you can tell I had fun putting this together today, right? <laughs> Let's take a look at the real deal. All right. What is the real deal? Three gallons a minute. Oops, I'm sorry. Three gallons a minute should be a uh, point. Let's go back one. Three Triple gallons nine. a minute with yeah. three quarter inch M is 0 0.009. 0 0.009. And I didn't update this. 0 0.009. We come up to, it says here, 8.3 feet ahead, actually at 0 0.009. We're going to get down to around six to seven feet ahead. All right. So 160, well, let's, let's, we'll whip this out real quick for you, gang, because we have the technology right here. Okay. So 160 times 1.5 for the fittings times 0 0.009 equals. 2.16 PSI times 2.31, we're five feet ahead. I'm sorry, we're five feet ahead. So in reality, in reality, we need three gallons a minute at five feet of head. Now that's why that, you know what, that that low speed is going to be dandy, all right? That low speed is going to work out just fine. And the farther we get away from low speed, going to medium to high, all right, that's going to cause us nothing but grief. That's going to make that delta T shrink smaller and smaller and smaller as we intersect higher and higher up on that those high speed pump curves and we get more flow. So that's why the math is your friend here. And what we can say in almost in most cases when you when you have when you're using a three speed pump as a zone pump in anything other than maybe radiant, you're going to be low speed's going to be your friend. Okay, low speed is going to be your friend. Okay, so again, the, sorry, this little pump curve is going to be a little bit off based on the fact I didn't do the math correctly. So see, everybody makes mistakes, right? Everybody makes mistakes. So again, same thing, only different. Our delta T's are going to be much, much smaller, much, much smaller. And again, these are based on these weren't based on five foot ahead. These were based on 8.3 feet ahead. So think about that five foot ahead. If when we math it out, when we estimated it, we were at almost 10. Okay, we were at almost 10. And that's simply because the estimating portion of this of this um, formula is based upon the maximum flow rate for an individual size to pipe. The maximum flow rate for quarter inch copper is four gallons per minute in a closed loop system. We only were pumping three gallons a minute. We only needed three gallons a minute. So the actual head at three gallons a minute was about five foot ahead, all right? So there's your difference. There's your difference. Cool. How are we doing out there, gang? Doing good. Doing we good. Doing questions? Good. All right. Now, there's my man, Eric, who never joins us on my Wednesday nights. We, 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 we are very lonely without Eric. We love John. We love Tim. And apparently, John and Tim love us more than Eric does because we never see <laughs> Eric on, he, on, our, on our Wednesday night applications. And, you know, zone valves... You know why people like to like to like to pipe up systems with zone valves? Well, they like the zone with zone valves. Well, clearly looking at that picture, it's because zone valves make you happy. <laughs> Look at is that a happy guy? I think we ought to nickname. I think Eric should be nicknamed Happy. Happy Yanni. <laughs> anyway, 
if I've got zone valve jobs, I'm going to need high speed then, right? Because I got to pump through all those zone valves, man. So I'm going to need high speed then. Well, an important point, very important point in a zone valve system. It's what we call a parallel piping system. So I, I, what that means is I only need to size my circulator for the worst case head loss zone. I have to, the flow is cumulative. I have to presume that all of those zones will be open at once and I have to deliver the total flow rate for the job. So flow is cumulative, but head is not because of the parallel nature of the piping system. Let's say I have three zones. I have one zone that is five foot ahead, one zone that is four foot ahead, and one zone that is three foot ahead. Well, I don't have to add five, four, and three together and have my pump do 12 foot ahead. Look at it another way. If my pump can overcome five foot ahead, well, can it overcome four foot ahead too? Yeah, it can. Yeah. If it can overcome three foot ahead, it can. if it can overcome five foot ahead, it can overcome three foot ahead as well. So in a parallel piping system, the water doesn't have to go through at one time all three zones in a series. I've got some water going through my five foot ahead zone, some water going through my four foot ahead zone, and some water going through my three foot ahead zone. Only size the pump for the worst case head loss zone. You don't have to add them all together. That is a big, big difference when it comes to sizing a pump for zone valve applications. You don't generally need that large, that high of a head kind of a situation. And when we're talking about fin tube, again, radiant with manifold actuators, it's going to be the worst case loop on that zone. Okay, it's going to be the worst case loop on that zone. You don't add them all, add all those together either. But you do have to factor in the worst case loop and then add in the head loss for all of your supply and return piping that would be in series with that loop. Correct. And so that you would add together. Yeah. All right. I want to go back here and uh, I'm missing the slide here. Um, it's going to be the Taco Taco uh, Taco After Dark Wednesday Night Murder Mystery. All right, <laughs> we're going to play Columbo. We're going to put our inner Columbo on, and this is a system that we were working on that, that I remember getting a call on and tried to help out. We're, we're uh, a customer replaced a boiler, did a boiler replacement, and he had a bunch of zone valves. Okay, it was about an 80, I think 80 to 90, I think it was about a 90,000 BTU zone, a 90,000 BTU load with a bunch of zones. Each zone was about 1.6 to 2 gallons per minute. And the highest head loss zone was about five foot ahead. All right. The old boiler had an old Taco 110 circulator. Okay, it had this guy right here, an old Taco 110 circulator. They could go up to over 30 gallons a minute, but it maxed out at about seven feet ahead. Okay, really good pump for zone valve jobs, but that's that's a different discussion. When they replaced the boiler, they decided to go three speed because the 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 the, the prevailing theory was a three speed pump was the only one you'll ever need because it had three speeds. And the wholesaler said to me, he says, "You well, yeah, three speed pump is like." You know, low speed's a 006, medium speed's a 007, high speed's 008, right? No, wrong, not even close. They're just three different curve, three different variations on the same shape curve. So what he did was he put in this three-speed pump. The problem was zone valves were banging like hell. When they would close, they would bang like hell. They didn't bang with the with the 110. The minute they put in the whole new system with whole new everything, guy told me best of everything, best of everything. 0015 was banging at high speed. They turned it down to medium, banging at medium speed, turned it down to low, banged at low speed. Say, so, well, there's got to that, that there's got to be something wrong with that Taco pump. Let's take the Taco pump out of there and let's put in a Grunfuss 1558. The Taco pump's obviously the problem, so it's got to be a 1550. You know, let's put in the 1558. Well, they put in the 1558 and Glorioski, it was still banging away. All right, even at low speed. And the wholesaler called me up and he told me this story. And I said, and he, and he said, you know, we have a problem here. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ed. What pump's in there now? He said, well, it's the Grunfoss. And I said, Ed, how do we have a problem? <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see how we have a problem. He said, oh, come on, man. And I said, well, who, who's your friend? Who'd you call? Who's your friend? And he goes, you, you, okay. I'll, I'll help you out. Just understand who, who you called. 
Um, why? Why were the zone valves banging? Why were the zone valves banging? All right. Can Columbo figure this out? You know, do you think, Col Dave, could Columbo figure this out? Rick, could Columbo figure this one out? Do you need to be Columbo to figure this one out? Only right at the very end of the episode would he figure it out. Yeah, that's right. Now he knew. Now you know Columbo. He knew. He knew within five minutes of meeting the murderer that that was the murderer. He just spent the rest of the show fit, trying to nail him. Hey, hold the, on, that's profiling. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but he knew. He was never wrong. Not at least not on TV, right? <laughs> so why were they banging, guys? What do you think? Why were they banging? We have some answers from here, the huh? audience, right? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. High head, slam and shut, too much head pressure. Head Head's too, too high. high. You guys got it. Yeah. You guys got it. It's a steep curve pump. That's right. That's right. And here's here's the detail here. So again, here's your low. Here's here's where we were intersecting the pump curves with all zones calling and with just one zone calling. All right, here's how we were intersecting the pump curve at the take with the take 110. And you could see like, big changes in flow, big changes in flow, very small changes in head pressure differential created by the circulator. That's the joy of a flat curve pump in a zone valve application. We talked about that last week. All right. Once he put the 0015 in, all right, here's your pump, here's your 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 points of intersection. All right. Here's all zones calling. Here's one zone calling. So here's my system curve. He's intersecting way out here. All right. Forget that, that he's over pumping by a gajillion gallons per minute here. But with all zones calling, he's only at about not nine foot ahead. With all zones calling and one zone closes, you know, maybe we're intersecting up here someplace, okay? That might not quite be enough to get the system to bang, or maybe it is, I don't know. We'd have to go back and look. The problem was up here, okay? With more of these system curves intersecting way up here, now we're banging against 13, 14, 15, 16 feet of head pressure differential, and that's what causes zone valves to bang. Whether they're, you know, those synchronous motors, spring return paddle types, whether they're the, the ball valve types, the, 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 like the zone century or the heat motor types like the, uh, like the, the 570 series, they're going to bang. At that point, they, they, they don't want to close against that much head pressure differential. They're going to let you know and they're going to bang. All right. So, again, with the Grunfoss, he had the same set of problems. OK, same set of problems, even at low speed. So we were finding is, OK, even around here. Even around there, we were having some banging issues. All right. So, so, huh? This is this is like the perfect storm. So, even at low speed, we're having banging issues. And here's the other thing: even if we weren't banging at low speed, look at this. At low speed, you this is the best you're going to get in terms of flow and BTU delivery. Might not be enough to to heat the zone. Again, depends on how wide that delta T gets, and what we would see. So. The banging zone valve was caused by the wrong pump. Okay, it was caused by the wrong pump. Now, if we were to do it this way, okay, looky loo right here, okay, with the 0010, you see it's intersecting at the same spot, but it's a flat curve pump, so we're intersecting at about seven feet ahead. And if we go over here, we're intersecting at less than 10. I bet you dollars to donuts, there's no banging there. Uh, there will not be any banging. Okay, that would take care of the problem. In fact, what he did was he put a 007 on the job, and that took care of it. It was just enough to make the banging go away. And, and so, the 007 is is close to your 0010 on speed medium there. Yeah, right. Curve it, yeah, it's it's. I'm sorry, not low there, but medium. It's close to the medium speed right there. Yep, you're right. Okay. In fact, it's right here. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And you can see it made Colombo very, very happy. So now he's puffing away. So Cecilia says, so flat curves for zoning, for zone valves. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so ding, 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 ding. Zone valves. That's right. That's right. So not saying that three speeds can't do zone valves because they have done them for many, many years. Um, but when you have zones that are different sizes and where you can change and jump up on that curve and have a large delta P difference, that's where the noises come into play. 
So if they were not a lot of differences in between them, then okay, you could probably get away with it. But a flat curve is definitely way, way, way better um, for a zone valve system, correct? So another yeah. question came in from Bill. And he's like, what if you used a valve that partially closing it to create more foot ahead resistance to eat up some of that excess head? But then we still have some flow going through, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure where you're going with that, Bill, but it, you'd still be getting flow to the zones that don't want it anymore and the room could overheat. So that's like the same way what other guys uh, I've heard say in a class, well, I got this banging going on, so I'm going to go into that zone valve power head, and it's got two springs in there. So I'm going to pop one off so it doesn't close as fast. Well, the reason for the zone, the springs is not to make it close fast. The springs are designed to keep the valve closed against the head pressure of the circulator. All mm -hmm. right, so otherwise you could get blow by through that zone if you pop the springs off. So you got to be careful of that. So I've heard that conversation quite a few times. Oh, pop the spring off, you'll be fine. All right, you're going to get some bleed by on there, and you could over yep. zone. Yep, yep. And and at that point, you're just putting band aids on a self inflicted wound, like we've talked about before. At that point, it, w w what do you want to do? You want to take a zone valve apart and play around with it for for a while, or do you want to put the right pump in? You know, there's uh, you know. Or uh, as Renee just said, what if you put in a pressure differential bypass? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not laughing at you, Renee. We just this is uh, this is just something that we always go into. It, it, it happens no matter every class. So just walk um, away, Renee. Just walk <laughs> away. Walk away. The left bank. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Renee. Um, you Agreed. could. Yes. You could put in a pressure differential bypass valve, but you know what? Here's the thing. What does a pre well? The the obvious question is, what does a pressure differential bypass valve do? Well, whenever you want to know what a valve does, just read its name backwards, right? A pressure differential bypass valve is a valve that bypasses the pressure differential. Well, duh, I get that, yeah. But in reality, a pressure differential bypass valve, once you install it, all a pressure differential bypass valve does is it turns a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump. That's all it does. It turns a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump. And in reality, in this instance, in you know, looking at it, well, I will put in my three-speed circulator, but I will also put in a pressure differential bypass valve to keep the thing from banging. That's a self that's a band-aid on a self-inflicted wound. That's I'm I that's basically saying I'm insisting on using the wrong pump for the job. Yep. And to make that problem that I am cre I'm creating a problem right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve the problem right here, but I'm going to spend some more of my customer's money to do it. I'm solving a problem. I'm spending my customer's money right here to solve a problem right here that I created, knowingly created three feet, three feet previously, you know, in advance of that. I don't know of any, if you explained it like that to a customer, I don't know, any customer would say, yeah, sure, go ahead, do it that way. Go ahead. I don't mind spending money to solve a problem that you yourself created. Um, so in that case, no, a pressure differential bypass valve is a Band-Aid for a self-inflicted wound. I've heard people say, well, why don't you just, in, I, rather than take out the pump that I put in, why don't I just pipe in a pressure differential bypass valve to solve the problem? Well, okay, that will solve the problem, but it might be the most expensive solution there is to the problem because you yeah. have to drain the system. You have a significant amount of invasive surgery to install the pressure differential bypass valve. You got to refill, repurge the system, go through all of that rigmarole, and then you got to figure out how to set the thing which is no easy task either. Or, or you could just take out the wrong pump and put in the right pump, okay? It, we call it the hydronics hokey pokey. You take the wrong pump out, you put the right pump in. <laughs> All right, that may, be, that may tell you a little bit more about what I do in my spare time than you need to know, but, but still, it, 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 that might be the, the fastest, simplest, cheapest, easiest solution. OK, especially if you especially if you have if you have, uh, uh, you know, isolation flanges. Now, I know people who would rather give up a kidney than replace a pump that they just put in and admit that it was the wrong pump. They'd rather give up a kidney than do that. But if it's if it's time and money, you know, it's I think the, 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 the fastest, quickest, easiest and surest and least expensive ultimately solu ultimately solution is to take the wrong pump out and put the right pump in. Rodney and if you're makes a good point. Say again? 
Rodney makes a good point. He says, yeah, but if the engineer specifies it, draws it in the detail and everything, Rodney, you're right. You're going to put in what the engineer wants, and then yep. you're going to charge him a change order when it doesn't work right. So. Absolutely. And that's in your, that's it. You write that in your contract. Yeah. All right. That, that, that the, if any changes, any changes in installation or products or materials have to be made due to the engineer specifications that we, they will be at the engineer's expense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know how many, how many arguments you win with a, with an engineer, right? <laughs> If there are any engineers out there, I apologize in advance. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. All right. All right. You're off, so, you're off the Christmas card list. I'm off the Christmas card list. There we go. Basic guidelines for 0015 three speed if you're zone pumping with fin tube baseboard. That's about as far as deep into the guidelines as we can give you here. Uh, if it's 40 equal to, less than or equal to 40,000 BTUs and you've got less than 120 feet of measured length pipe, low speed. You know, low speed. Easy. Less than 40, equal to or less than 40,000 BTUs and 235 feet measured length. Then you go to medium and 290 feet. You'd have that's when you that's when you'd look at high. Okay, if you're if you're up there around 290 feet, go to high speed. So those are your basic guidelines for your three speed uh, for 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 uh, setting up a, a 0015 three speed pump. Now to think about this for a second. 40,000 BTUs, three quarter inch pipe. That's going to be about 72 feet of baseboard and 290 feet, or now 200 feet of pipe, 220 feet of pipe. That means you're probably heating the neighbor's house if you had 220 feet of pipe. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's kind of hard to really, really need a baseboard zone with 70, you know, 70 feet of baseboard and 220 feet, you know, 110 feet away. Okay, so uh, just something to think about there. <clears throat> very good, very good. All righty. Uh, just a couple of other three speed pumps to, to let you know about. We have the 0015, which is down here. Okay, this is the 0015 right here. And then we have the 0013. 13 three speed which is up above okay the double oops i'm sorry the 0013 which is you might think well logically the 15 should be bigger than the 13 but in this case the 13 is bigger than the 15 because the 13 was there already okay and we just added a three speed version of our single speed 0013 so you, this is where you're getting into larger applications 30 feet ahead all the way out to 30 31 gallons per minute Okay, now you might be using these, we might be looking at really large radiant systems. You might be looking at snow melt systems. Uh, Rick and Dave, what other types of applications have you seen the 0013 used in? Uh, like a little a brace plate heat exchanger has a lot of pressure drop depending on what they're doing. Sometimes you'll need things like that. So, yeah. Very good, very good. And then we have our flatter curves. Even though these don't look that flat, you just have to understand the the scale down at the bottom okay so they are flatter curve circulators the 0010 three speed is the one we already talked about and then it's big brother the 0012 again now we're talking maxing out at about 14 feet ahead you know but we're going way 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 out into the 40s for gpm okay so this is again a, a high flow low head type of an application and again what types of applications would you see these in That was for Dave and Rick. No. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was doing something else. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to keep you. <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's typing. So high flow, low head situations. Mm -hmm. uh, again, oh, I might have uh, some of the old indirects that uh, I used to sell quite a few of have very low right. pressure drop and right. need lots of flow because you're trying to transfer a bunch of energy. So again, depending on the heat exchanger configuration, this might be excellent for those low pressure drop uh, applications. So. Very good. Very good. All right. Coolness, coolness. Okay. Uh, and again, there's your Taco 0012 and 0013s. Again, now take a little closer look at the at the curves. Uh, and there you see the 0013. Get a little higher head, lower flow, and the 0012 is lower head and higher flow. And again, just to remind you, just one more thing. Don't forget the St. Patty's Day extravaganza, man. 
Uh, get out on Facebook, get out on Instagram, email Dave with your tips and tricks and submit those to win the big package in our, our, our March 17th St. Paddy's Day finale for, Saint, uh, for uh, Takeo After Dark, the winter essentials. Be well, a wiener. Much, be a wiener, that's right. Be a wiener. That's a wrap on tonight, guys. <laughs> that's a wrap on tonight. There's my man, Columbo. He's a good man. That was one of my favorites. Absolutely one of my favorite shows. So, all righty. Let's uh, get rid of the... Uh, get rid of the... Uh, presentation don't do that actually no because we got to go back to one of the questions that was earlier was oh. text so but you could also take a look at the text pressure drop charts in the takeaways book which also had the copper tube handbook chart in there too so the takeaways had it as well as the catalog in the back of the catalog had it also so we've given you plenty of information to take a look at look at that but we wanted to review pressure drop with pex tonight also, okay. the end of class. There, another, well, you guys, I, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I will get that presentation up. Uh, if you guys want to take over the con here, I'll go grab that pe presentation and I'll be right back. There's a, there's right, another, uh, you folks look up the Plastic Piping Institute has a nice calculator uh, on their, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, their website. And uh, remember, it's a Plastic Piping Institute. They have lots of different pipe other than PEX. So you, you have to kind of drill down to what, pipe specifically you want to do the pressure drop calculation on but they ask all the right questions you're going to give it the flow you're going to give the temperature the average temperature of the fluid you know the the length it gives it's even a nice little thing that you know they'll ask you about the number of elbows and that sort of thing so that's just another uh non-proprietary uh, view uh, of product and what the pressure drop results will be so just another one to look up I I forgot all about that. I got to yeah. take a look at that myself a little further on yeah. where that is. It's it buried in there somewhere. It looks like I'm on the website right now, pp uh, plasticpipe.org, but I'm not finding it at the moment. But I'm sure it's buried in, <clears throat> in there. Excellent. Maybe we Any can, questions, guys? We oh, can put Richard. it on the takeaways, uh, and then they can de uh, just cut and paste it, I guess. So. All right, uh, Richard asked a question. In Radiant, do you add pressure drop? Do you add drop through PEX and the pressure drop through the manifold together? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you need to add them together. Yes. The the charts. These charts are going to show you just the pressure drop uh, through the pipe itself and the length of pipe that you have. Then, depending upon which manifold you have, is also going to have associated pressure drop. And then you need to take into account the length of rigid pipe it took to get to that manifold from where the circulator is and then also take into account the pressure drop of the mixing valve if you have one in there too so there is quite a bit of pressure drop when it comes to radiant floors and that's why a lot of times we may see radiant floors looking for a three-speed circulator not necessarily looking for three-speed but looking for a high head circulator uh like and you know what this this whole section of this presentation comes from our factory training class, and we're going to walk right through that whole thing. All right, we're going to walk through that whole that whole portion of it of of adding the additional head loss. Uh, but I wanted to show you uh, the PEX pressure loss uh, uh, chart that we were re they were referencing. This specific one comes from Mr. PEX. All right, that's from their design manual. Uh, if any, and, and the, the good thing about this is it's pretty much going to be universal to all yep. of the different PEX manufacturers. If, they, if they're making an SDR9 PEX tubing, yep. the pressure drops are going to be the same because the dimensional ratios are the same. It'd be like copper. It's the same size. So in the example I'm showing in, in here, we were talking about using PEX to pipe up some, some radiators. I just want to show you what it might be for a radiant system, okay? So let's say I've got I've got five loops on a radiant manifold, okay? And they range in flow on that manifold from 0.4 GPM up to 0.8 GPM. We're not talking about a lot of flow rate here, you know, because we've 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 split it up uh, for these different for these different rooms, for the different loops. Okay, so this is just one per loop, and a loop might be covering a rather small area. So let's say the longest loop is the point uh is is uh, uh is is eight tenths of a gallon and i'm using half inch pecs so 
eight tenths of a gallon and half inch PEX, my pressure drop for one foot of pipe is going to be 0 0.02. Okay, 0 0.02 feet of head for one foot of pipe. And let's say that loop is 270 feet long. So 200 and that include you know 270 feet in the in the in the uh, you know from from start to finish. So 270 feet times 0 0.02 is going to give me the head loss for that worst case loop. All right, and let's figure that out. 270 times 0 0.02 equals 5.4 feet ahead. So that's my worst case loop on that manifold is 5.4 gallons per minute. All right. Hey, John. I'm sorry. Feet ahead. 5.4 feet ahead. That's my worst case loop. 5.4 feet ahead. Yes, sir. Um, that chart, though, doesn't say feet of head. I'm just noticing something. It doesn't say yeah. feet ahead. It, it, it is feet ahead. It okay, doesn't say feet say ahead. That. But but this is feet ahead, yes. Okay, all right, cool. It's not PSI. This is the the, the chart. This uh, the uh, Mr. Pex does express it in feet of head. Okay, cool. Okay, all so right. it's point point zero two feet ahead per foot of pipe times two hundred and seventy feet. So my head loss just for that loop of Pex is five point four feet of head. Now I've got a bunch of other loops on there, but as we said earlier, that's a parallel piping system. I don't have to add them all together. I don't have to add them all together. I do have to add the flow together because I have to be, have a circulator that will deliver all of the flow for that manifold. But head loss is the worst case one on that loop. Okay. So now I want to jump ahead here. Okay. A little bit and do this one here. Okay. How do we figure this out in terms of circulator sizing, et cetera? So this example, my total flow rate for that one manifold was six gallons a minute. Let's let's say that total flow rate for that entire manifold is six gallons a minute, and we'll bump it up to 5.5 feet ahead just for the manifold and the tubing itself. Our supply and return piping, the copper piping I need to deliver that, you know, from my mix valve, et cetera, wherever, to the manifold and back again, that's another three and a half feet of head. So I've got six gallons a minute now at 5.5 plus 3.5. So that's a total of six gallons a minute now at nine feet of head. I have to add that rest of that head in series. That's head in series. Now I have to look at my mix valve or my tempering valve. With the mix valve or my tempering valve, I have to understand something called the CV rating or flow coefficient. It's the pressure drop through a valve. A CV rating is actually the flow needed through a piping component to create one PSI worth of pressure drop, and one PSI worth of pressure drop is worth 2.31 feet of head loss. So I need to look at the rating on the valve, and then I need to know this math. Flow, the actual flow rate through a valve, divided by the CV rating of the valve, squared, so flow divided by CV, whatever you come up with, you square it, then you multiply it by 2.31, and that gives you the pressure loss in feet of head through that valve at that flow rate. What does that all mean? <laughs> Let's take a look. Tempering valves, fixed temperature radiant. You know, they're, they're great. People love them because they're cheap and they're non-electric, but it's a very low CV, which means it has a very high pressure drop. Okay. Our series 5,000 uh, mixing valves. Okay. At six gallons a minute, we'd be looking at a one-inch valve here, right? Six gallons a minute would be a one-inch valve, all right? And that valve has a CV of 3.8. Now, we could do the arithmetic, but we could also say, all right, just look at the chart here, six gallons a minute, that's an additional, an additional 5.76 feet ahead, all right? 5.76 feet ahead, I have to add to what I already had, so... Here we go. 5.5, 3.5 is 9 plus 5.8. That's 14. Point, that's about 15 feet ahead. So I need now a circulator that'll do six gallons a minute at about 15 feet ahead. Okay. Uh oh. As you can see, we're on the outer edge. Now, again, will we be okay there? 
Yes. I would I would say, yeah, we're going to be just fine there because is there any fudge built into any of these numbers? Probably when we did the heat loss and all these other things that all built, there's all that stuff built in that, that, you know, that is just there. Okay. Uh, that, that's going to tell us, we, you know, we're probably less than that. How did we come up with the head loss through our piping, uh, through our, our hard piping, et cetera? Did we estimate that? I mean, there's a lot of questions to answer, but we're not that far outside of the performance. So again, if the numbers were dead on accurate and we used high speed and it wasn't quite enough, the only thing would happen, the worst thing that would happen is when it got really, really cold out, all right, when we hit design conditions, we designed this radiant system to, let's say, a 10 degree delta T, which is what you design a radiant system, a residential radiant for. So instead of it being a 10 degree delta T, it might widen up to a 12 or a 13 degree delta T, and that's not that horrible. Okay, so you could still use that circulator at high speed under that under that set of circumstances. Hey, John. Yo. Uh, a couple questions there. One of them is they're looking for uh, pressure drop calculations for uh, like Schedule 40 iron pipe. And I, I looked around. I got an old Grinnell thing and a Burnham, Well McLean. A, a lot of those will have that in there. But I think if you just do a web search on pressure drop for steel pipe Schedule 40, you'll probably find all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing um, had to do with uh, kind of a secret a secret, well, B&G's uh, circuit uh, a balancing wheel, uh, John, is what John's pointing yeah, the out right The system sizer wheel will help you. Yeah, that's all based on steel pipe. It, and it on gives the back, you copper, it actually has copper you, and, and both. So uh, no, another good resource. Right. Uh, but how many, this kind of a, not a trick question, but how many believe that the longest loop on the manifold will have the highest pressure drop if the manifold's serving multiple zones? <laughs> you give me give me an answer folks how many people feel the longest loop on the manifold will be the loop that has the greatest pressure drop on a manifold that serves multiple zones yeah what it's do you think just off the, it's off the top of your head kind of thing what i mean intuitively you would think yeah i got probably yes as long as the tubing size is the same See, that's that's kind of what we want you to start thinking about, okay? But doesn't flow have something to do with the total amount yep. of pressure drop? What if I had a shorter loop with higher flow where the resultant pressure drop was higher than the loop that was longer? Happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So not so. Don't you think just because the loop is longer, it'll have the higher pressure drop if it's serving multiple zones. We're talking about having uh, telestats or actuators on the manifold that open and close and such. So uh, again, you, the 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 software that you're using from the tubing manufacturer usually tells you everything you need to know. Dave was talking earlier about all the things that need to go into a cumulative head loss calculation. We need to know what the the loop that has the highest, and we need to know the manifold, the CV. Actually, the manifolds have a CV. And that's built into that calculation. Then we have the supply and return and all the incidental things near boiler piping, et cetera, all that good stuff, right? So the software will normally give you the ability to come up with that total head calculation that includes all those things that have to be uh, uh, calculated. So just a little uh, little trick there, a little trick question to get you uh, get you to scratch your head a little bit. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Rick. I, I remember when we used to teach teach radiant design when we were with Worsbow, would yeah. be would be you know the, is the longest loop on a manifold isn't necessarily the highest head one if the flow rate is very low. You know, you could have a short loop that has a higher flow rate that has a higher head loss. So you you, you can't you, you're right. You can't always default that. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a that's a that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Uh, one, one question here is about Bob said you can set your flow individually for, per loop with the manifold. Well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Um, though, how, here's a well. Here's another question. How many of you believe that those those valves on manifolds are actual circuit setters? Because they're not called flow. You know, they 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 don't really set the flow per se, what they do is, is they're balancing valves. They're balancing valves. So what they do is they essentially trick 
trick the water into thinking all of the loops are the same length, all right? They, they, they basically just trick the water into thinking all of the loops are the same length, so there's no shortcuts. So we get flow through all the loops. That's what those things are really meant to do. And then your zoning takes care of the flow, your, 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 your manifold actuators take care of your zoning on that manifold. So interesting. It's, it's, it's an, it, uh, I remember when we were teaching that and it dawned on me that we weren't setting the GPM. We were just tricking the water into thinking all the loops were the same length and everybody was happy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's another a good dynamic question. balance. It's, it, uh, yep, there you go. And yeah, you can't, and you can't just, if you wanted to change something, you can't just tweak the flow on one of those because you'll screw up the flow through every other loop on that manifold. <laughs> Indeed, it's called a balancing act. A balancing act, there you go, there you go. All right, uh, here's a good question from Cecilia, another good one. If this, if this pump 0015 will work under that condition, even when it looks out of the curve, when do you consider that the point is too far and you'd have to go to a different model. Now that's a really good question. We, we're actually that talking about that really today good on, on a domestic water uh, thing. You know, we're saying, what could we push that? You know, like in this case, we're a little bit higher. Are we 5% right. higher on the pressure? You know, everything that we use from a balancing standpoint usually says some kind of get out of jail weasel clause thing that says, oh, we're accurate within about five percent so five percent is considered within our industry acceptable so if we were if we're our uh, duty point was five percent higher than what the pump curve would it still be acceptable i i if you ask me my opinion absolutely because remember how much fudge that we have in all these numbers anyway especially if you're using fitting valve and fitting factors that's absolute fudge Yep, you're absolutely right. You're, yes. That multiplied by 1.5, it's it's a it's it is a a conservative overestimate. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, we're estimating this conservatively so we don't get in trouble. And and and, and that goes back to that. If you really want to know, then you go in and you count the different types of fittings, figure out the equivalent length of pipe, and and include it that way. So it yeah, I I would say I mean seriously. I, if you're, if you're out in, in in that area somewhere, again, the worst thing that's going to happen, and only when it's really cold, is that your, your delta T is going to get a little wider. Now, if my requirement was way the heck up here, I think now we're getting out of we're getting a little out of control. We're getting a little out of what we would consider reasonable. Okay. And and if that did happen, if you did install a circulator where your design point was way out there, guess what? It's going to work probably 70, 80% of the winter. Mm -hmm. So people won't know that it's not working until it gets really cold. And here's the scenario, here's the funny thing that happens. So once it gets really cold, all of a sudden, as as we've all experienced, most of you guys out there, the last couple of weeks, you've been busting horns and, and keeping the heat on for people, right? Things are getting taxed across the entire country. And you're getting phone calls saying, can you come to my house? It's 42 degrees in there, inside. Yes, I will hurry up and get there and do the boiler replacement, whatever needs to be done. But then the homeowner that has this system installed says, oh, my he's, my house isn't keeping up. It's about 67 in here. I have it set for 70. It's 67. It's not keeping up. Well, you're on a job site where it's 42 degrees inside the house. Which one's more important? Sure. The house is 42 degrees. So as time goes by and you say, all right, I'll get to you when I can. I'm sorry, but I got a lot of freeze ups. And for the most part, you know, if they're a good customer of yours, they'll wait for you. If they're not, they'll make other phone calls. But you get there in three or four days, two days even, you know, and a lot of times it warms up and then all of a sudden you walk in the house and everything is fine. Oh, yeah, the heat is fine. I forgot to call you. And then while you're there, you go to the house, you go downstairs, you take a look, you turn things on, you turn things off. The pumps pump you late and the zone valves are zone rating and, and I don't know, everything looks good right this is this happens a lot more than we know more than we know because it just doesn't keep up so but actually interesting story i have the exact same issue going on in my house right now actually not my house it's my my apartment where my mother-in-law lives and i have a three-speed pump actually um the, when it's on high it heats just fine 
but I am getting a, a, a noise in the house you know, on a radiant manifold. And when the actuators close, it goes from, and, and when I did manifolds to manifolds, well, long story, um, I do need to change the circ and a new one's sitting right next to it for about two years. <laughs> so, but normally I run the house on medium speed and I don't have this harmonic noise that I, that I got going on. But when we hit the really cold design days, it doesn't keep up. My mother-in-law likes it 75 degrees in her house with radiant floor heat. Okay. And all of a sudden, when we hit those cold days, it's 72 and she's cold. So I have to turn the speed of the of the pump back up again to satisfy, put it on speed uh, on high, and then she's good. So, um, so yeah, it happens. Bill's and got a yes, warning I will about call the boiler manufacturer when it doesn't work again. So, so Bill's got a warning about, um, you know, long circuitry on baseboard, not to stretch that delta T out because of those 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 uh, pieces of fin tube that are at the end of the run, et cetera. But no, most of the time, uh, if we were going to uh, design a delta T and stretch it out on a baseboard job, we're going to design accordingly. We're going to have extra fin tube for those lower average water temperatures out on those end zones. And, and strategically, uh, when we lay out the initial system, we kind of know which one should be supply, which parts of baseboard uh, uh, should be on the supply side and which ones are accounted for to be on the return side. So that's a good point, Bill. Yeah, and let's, let's take a, another look at the calculating heat loss and how, oversized heat loss uh, and most heat losses are actual actually are or how overestimated heat loss calculations actually are i mean it, this this is not going to be an unusual story for any of you who who've done heat loss calculations but when i was growing up uh in harvard massachusetts we had a local wholesaler do all of our heat loss calculations and every time they 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 would send us back this report on the heat loss calc. We'd send them the blueprints. They'd have a report that says this system is designed to maintain 72 degrees indoors at minus 10 outdoors. We used minus 10 in central Massachusetts, east northeastern central Massachusetts, as our outdoor design temperature. Now I lived in that part of Massachusetts for 35 years, and I never once saw it hit minus 15 or minus 10. Never even got close. Coldest I ever remember getting was the winter in 93. We hit like one below, two below for very brief shots of time for about a week and a half. And Time Magazine thought that a cover article that said the next ice age was coming. All right. For that brief period of time. Um, the actual outdoor design condition, design criteria for that part of Massachusetts per ASHRAE was seven above. So every heat loss calculation we did was overstated by 17 degrees in time, design temperature difference. So that, at that point, we're looking, even the, the math that was done for us was faulty. It was exaggerated. So again, we look at that, it, uh, we, we look at the reality of the heat load versus what we calculated slash estimated. Uh, is there a difference there? How much, I mean, if you look at fudge, even if you do the, the heat loss calculation by the book, by the numbers, and don't exaggerate a thing, there's enough fudge in there to make us all diabetic, all right? You talk about, uh, Rick's laughing because I use that joke every single time. Um, I love it. I love it, man. But, you know, infiltration is a guess, right? Infiltration is based upon a 25 mile an hour wind blowing in all four directions at the same time. How the hell is that going to happen? All right, but they had to come up with a number. Okay, they had to give you something. So just the built-in numbers are 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 crazy wild, you know. And then you've got, you know, you're 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 doing your your dimensions. Okay, this room's 14 and three quarter inches, 14 feet three, and, you know, 14 and three quarter feet by, you know, 10 and seven eighths feet. All right, that's going to be 15 by 11. Eh, yeah, you know. So there's so much fudge built in there anyway, you know, what do you do? What do you do? You do the best you can and, and realize that, boy, oh boy, it's rare to have an underheated house <laughs> due to something that's been done. You know, it something that's been broken, something that's been installed improperly. Yeah. But when you, you do too, what I've seen is when, when people don't do the math, Generally speaking, do they undersize or do they oversize? 
Over. Almost every single time, because I'm yeah. not going to go do, I'm not going to, I don't have the time to do it right. All right. <laughs> so I'm just going to make sure I give them as many BTUs as I possibly can so I don't get that phone call. All right. When people don't do the math, they rarely undersize. They'll oversize to beat the band, but they'll, they, you know, and, and then there's the boiler replacements, right? The boiler replacements where they, 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 they just measure the baseboard or whatever, or they do a square footage of the house and multiply it by 35. Okay, 35 BTUs per square foot, that's got to be the load. And throw in a boiler can measure it with that. You know, now we're talking about just, you know, getting out of control oversized. You know, so I'm not wor as worried about undersizing at that point. I mean, it... it if we, I think, I think back to Cecilia's original question, which was 20 questions ago, but I think it was a really good one, was how far are we comfortable with? Me personally, I'm pretty, I'm comfortable with, you know, a couple of blocks on the grid. Yeah. You know, if you look at the pump at the pump performance curve, there's grids, right? It's a, a bunch of boxes on the grid. I'm comfortable with maybe two boxes on the grid. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, How are we doing out there? I was on Dave, a roll, man. Sorry, Dave. You oh. want to do the Rodney thing? I, I I think he's talking about the the boiler loop when when we used to pipe up cast iron with a, a boiler halo or a boiler loop, and we pulled off that with closely spaced tees. Hey, you guys will appreciate this. Who's calling me? Hey, yeah, <laughs> good man. I just right. talked to him not too long ago. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna busy. I'm peeling out here for a minute. Peel Doesn't out. He know we're busy. Come come on. I think he's going to give you some news. Um, so, uh, Rodney, just keep in, in mind that we have to come up with a GPM number based on how many BTUs you want to deliver in that boiler. And once we do that, then we look at what the, what is the pressure drop through the boiler seat exchanger? What is the pressure drop through that wild loop? And all the incidental valves and fittings and air separators and magnetic dirt separators and all the stuff that's within that circuitry and that's how we size the pump don't add any extra in there but as long as you consider all those things that will uh give you an accurate uh, circulator size for that wild loop all right i think i think that's what you meant by it yeah so yeah yeah see all righty, so I'm reading. Um, I'm reading some stuff right now uh, about the Chicago yep. place. Is that Dan? Okay. Yeah, Dan's just talking about way oversized. Yep. Yeah, but nobody ever freezes to death. Exactly right. Exactly right. So yeah, you won't get a call on that. But still, we're trying to get you to sharpen your pencil a little bit, not just not get a call, right? Uh, especially when when things are tight and you're bidding against people who really know their stuff. They're dotting their I's and crossing their T's. They'll win that bid because they'll know what they can do and still do a good job. If we're just wagging, I had a guy uh, that was a contractor years ago that just said he didn't want to do the math. He just ran one inch to all his manifolds, and we were doing a bunch of high-end radiant stuff. And it was like, why are you doing that? <laughs> I mean, if you run one inch to everything, one inch – Pipe, valves, fittings are a whole bunch more money than three-quarter. And in some cases, you could have just used some old 5.8 pecs and you would have been just fine, you know. So yeah. anyway, th those there's are the always, kind of things. There's always something good about that leftover pecs from job to job. And I know lots yeah. of guys, you take, a, you take a, 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 a length of pipe and you throw it in the back of the truck and you leave it there for months on end. It gets trashed, it gets all beat up, and then you end up throwing it away. You know the beauty of that leftover pecs? You want to know how to make money in this industry? Piece of pipe. Sell something twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because the first time you bought it to get installed in a house. All right? And then you had leftover, threw it in the truck, thought you'd find a good use for it. Make sure you use I mean, so when we do a lot of the math and a lot of the pipe size calculations and formulas that we've been figuring out tonight, we want you to use the smallest pipe size allowable for the project. Because going larger with your pipe doesn't do anything for you except spend more money for the pipe itself and all the other accessories that you have to put on there. That's so right. um, so when we start talking about this math and going through it all, the math is not value engineering anything. 
A lot of people think it's value engineering. No, we're engineering it. You know, if we're saying use speed three or use speed one on a circulator, speed one is all you need. Speed three gets you nothing. Okay, it doesn't get you think anything more. Or, or here, his, you know, we at Taco didn't have three speed pumps for quite a while. We had all these double O single speed circulators out there for a really, really long time. And then three speeds came and poured it over and started, a lot of people started buying them, started liking them. They said, oh, this is pretty cool. I've got a three speed circulator. And then it was like, okay, well, Taco, you guys need to have one. And we resisted it. And the reason why we resisted it is not because they already had it and we didn't. We said, well, if we showed you how to do the math and you know what flow and head you need, what's the purpose of the three speed? Right? Because you knew exactly what you need. The three speed pump never changes speed in the middle of the winter, never changes speed for the entire life of the system. You find what speed you need it to run at and it goes. Yes, I know. I see, Rodney. Yeah, they're really common in your neck of the woods. And that's what John was talking about earlier. The reason why three speeds became so popular is because somebody came along and said, it's the only pump you'll ever need. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, but as we can see, as we saw today in a lot of our applications, a lot of our systems installs, we need speed low. Speed hey, low Dave. is going to work for a lot of the times. Uh, Rodney might be talking about the fact that it's putting in wild loops, and he's re he's he's telling us a little more about what a wild loop is in his world, and it's not the boiler loop that I just described. For some reason, they're running an open piece of pipe with no valving on it, and it's not doing anything. So, Rodney, I, 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 I have to ask, really why the hell would you do that? <laughs> well, it makes the noise go away. Uh, that uh, again. Yeah. There's a whole lot of things that make noise, and wild loops are not the right way to take it away. And I know you're not doing that, Rodney. I'm not getting on you, but I, we still – there's things that happen in the hydronic world that make us scratch our head. And look what happened. I lost all my hair from scratching my head. So, uh, John, you're on your way. There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'll be getting there. I'll be getting there. You took care of Mr. Cisco. All is good. Uh, let's see. Richard Summers, why, where did the rule of 35 BTUs per square foot come from? Is it the same formula as the fingers across the street held up to yeah. equal 50,000 BTUs yeah. per finger for sizing? Pretty Real much, close. yeah, pretty yeah. much. I'll tell you what, back back to my days as, a, as when I actually worked for a living for my dad, there was this rule of thumb in Massachusetts. Picture Massachusetts in your mind, man. You got Boston on one end and Stockbridge on the other. And the thing that connects the two is the Massachusetts Turnpike, Interstate 90. All right. And 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 that basically cuts the, the the state pretty much in half the long way. For years, for years, people believed to their and and still do. I believe I I I am sure that proper heat losses. If a house is north of Interstate 90, you figure 30 BTUs per square foot. If it's south of Interstate 90 you figure 20 BTUs per square foot because everybody knows the further south you get, the warmer it gets. And guys would look at me and go, it works. It works. Don't don't <laughs> don't bother me with this fancy book learning thing here. Throw it, it on the wall. See if it yeah. sticks. Yeah. And of course it works. You know, if you're if you're if 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 the house has a do the do the math and the house has a 17 BTU per square foot load and you're giving it 30, hell yeah, it's gonna heat. No one's going to freeze to death and blame you, but that's just the way it is, you know? Yeah. And I, I it, it, yeah. hey, you know, it is what it is, right? Some so, of that yeah, 30. Yeah, Bob, 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 that's a really good point that you're not heating, a, you're, you're not, you're heating a volume, not square footage, right? Because it, it, what if it's an eight foot ceiling versus a 15 foot ceiling or, exactly. eight foot, or you know, one, this entire south facing area is nothing but windows you know it's all the walls of glass you know uh sure you got a lot of solar gain but not at night you know yeah. <laughs> another another wag that people would use would uh, would be based on cubic foot and they'd use four and a, between four and five btus per cubic foot and you times that by eight where are you at around what 35 or 40 btus a foot another uh 
thing that we used to use in the radiant world is you can reach a maximum surface temperature. It used to be 87 and a half degrees. I think they brought that back to 85. But at that temperature, you can exceed that number without potentially, at least in a, a, a habitable area, affecting the health of people's feet. So we have a high limit on the floor surface temperature that we have to deal with. So what that does is that limits at a 70 degree room temperature, that limits it to a certain amount of surface temperature. So we, we can only get you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 BTUs, maybe 35 BTUs a, a square foot out of the floor to keep the surface temperature from getting too high and messing people up from a health standpoint. So there's there's probably a lots of different directions that these rules of thumb come from. But um, ideally, we want to do the math. We want to do the room by room load calc and design the system for a room by room delivery. You will be surprised on how low your heat load is. Yeah. And so not the home that I'm in now, but the home that I I, I sold uh, back out out east on Long Island. And uh, when I bought the house, it was forced air furnace. And working for a radiant manufacturer, that was probably not allowed. I would, could have been fired if I kept it. So um, I eventually added radiant to the house. So as I did the design, I came in with my heat loss at 35,000 BTUs was the heat loss for my house on Long Island. And then guess what size furnace was installed? A hundred. Thousand BTUs <laughs> for the first floor. There was a second hundred thousand BTU furnace for the second floor, and I heated the house with thirty-five thousand BTUs. So yeah. trust, trust, trust the math. When you use a rule of thumb, all right. And then John has said this many, many times. Whatever rule that you have, use the words your honor in either the beginning or end of the sentence and see if it holds water yes yeah yep. yeah all right better have that's paperwork the, to back it up that's the litmus test right there <laughs> use the words your honor and i got pulled into a court case once all right and try explaining heat loss to a bunch of engineers i mean to lawyers i'm sorry to lawyers i i was pulled into this i did three days of deposition Try, and all they were trying to do was catch me up on different ways of saying the same thing. It was it was painful. It was really, really painful. They considered me uh, a hydronics heat loss expert because that's what I did for a living. Um, by the end, I, they I, considered you a hostile witness, right? Oh, my God. I think at the end, they realized, <laughs> OK, we're not we're not going anywhere. It, basically, what ended up happening was the homeowners wanted uh, 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 like 77 degrees in the house with a radiant floor system. All right, but that information was never conveyed to the contractor, and he designed the house to heat to 70, and they couldn't get to 77 inside. Um, so it was just this court case that went back and forth, and you know, so I got involved and in basically saying, all right, I'll get involved and help you guys uh, as long as my company doesn't get pulled into the situation here. And they said, okay, perfect. All right, so it was between a builder and and a, and a homeowner, so it eventually got dropped because uh, they couldn't find anything you know, going on here, but trust the math, always trust the math. Yeah. And the rules of thumb have been, you know, the, 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 I, I can remember teaching a class once, this is many years ago on how to design a, a radiant system. And there was a guy in the front who looked like he was, he, he, like he was having a stroke. He just really wasn't enjoying the, the presentation <laughs> at all. And finally I, I looked at him and said, are you okay? And he goes, I don't want to know any of this. I really don't, don't want to know this. All I want to know is two things. Give me a rule of thumb to figure it. Fig, give me a rule of thumb to figure this all out and give me and tell me who's going to pay when it doesn't work. That's all I want to know. And I'm thinking, I, I had never done this before and I don't think I've ever done it since. I said, you know what? I don't think our product is right for you. And I gave him the name of our competitor. I said, I don't think we're a good match. I really don't. Because you got to know what you're doing. If you're the installer and you're taking money for it, you, this is all your responsibility. Right. You're going to get the call. Yeah. It, and 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 the the guys that really embrace that and learn it and know it, that's you know that's when you those are the professionals. Professionals don't guess. Okay. Professionals know. That's one of the one of the definitions of being a professional. Professionals 
go to classes on Wednesday night and stay for over almost two hours. You know, that's, that's what professionals do because it's an investment in what, in, in, in your knowledge. And that's, that's just the way it is. I, we talked about this last week about no, that, that whole thing about knowing pump curves and understanding how system curves and pump curves intersect and how that, those are the dynamics of a system. And that's inside baseball hydronics, man. That's what, that's what professionals embrace. Okay, they want to know that so they can use that and to, to help them do their jobs better. The, hand, the the glorified handyman say, I don't want to know any of that because it's confusing. Yeah. And I've had guys say to me, I don't want to know anything because if something goes wrong and I don't know anything, they can't blame me. That's right. I said, whoa, I don't, you know, if we're going to act, if we're going to be consider ourselves a profession, then we have to act professionally. I yeah. would not want a doctor who says, you know, if I learn too much about anatomy and something goes wrong, people are going to hold me responsible. So, <laughs> no, you know, better yet, you tell me how you want me to take your appendix out. You know, I, I just didn't want the customer what he wants. You know, so, whoa, 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 no. So, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, Bob, good point. As soon as you touch it, you're involved. Yeah. Yeah. You own it. That's that's yeah. why if there's a boiler with asbestos on it, I never touched it. I said, I don't, I know, because I don't want to own this thing. I, I just don't. And and I, I walked, I remember that was one of the few smart things I did when I was a contractor was walk away from a few jobs that just screamed, trouble, trouble, trouble. Joe Walsh, walk away. Yeah, just turn your pretty head and walk away. That's right, baby. <laughs> or this head anyway, yeah. So yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, you're right. It was wrong attitude. That guy, I mean, he he said, I don't want to know anything. I just want to know a rule. Give me a rule of thumb and you know, tell me who uh you know who who pays when it doesn't work. And I've had other guys say, Hey, we didn't do anything unless you told us to do it. I remember going and this was a job I went to go troubleshoot for the for a previous rep of the product. And he said, We didn't do anything unless they told us to do it. I said, So you you really didn't think, right? You know, you didn't think about, you know, insulation, you know, things like insulating, you know, the ends of the of the joist bays before they go outside. I said, well, nobody told us to do that. I said, well, nobody told you to put a roof on the house either. Right. But you did, you know, because like that, 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 that part from a, um, uh, the movie, A Few Good Men, when they were talking about the manual, it says, show me in the manual where it says how to get to the mess hall. It says, well, I don't think it's in the manual. Well, then. Did you not eat? I mean, if you won't do anything, if it's not in the manual, how did you eat? Well, I just followed the crowd at chow time. I said, well, okay. You, you learn to do things that you, you learn to think. You learn to think. Hey, I got a plug for uh, next week. Uh, how many folks out there actually feel really comfortable with the modes of an ECM circulator? Meaning you pull these things out of the box, they've got three, four, five different modes. And within each of those modes, they got multiple settings. How many people out there right now that are still with us real feel real comfortable with knowing what to do on the job with that circulator? So give us some feedback. Again, the question is how comfortable are you with knowing exactly what mode to use in each of the situations you might use an ECM circulator? No, we got to not Steve, vary. That's good. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, folks, I'm just telling you next week, we're going to try to really simplify things from the standpoint of looking at a piping, like a near boiler piping scheme. So pretend you're standing in, in a mechanical room at midnight on New Year's Eve, and you don't have time to do all the math that we talk about, but you would like to install this high efficiency circulator in place of a, a standard efficiency circulator that's no longer working. And you'd kind of like to get the, at least get the mode right. Now, depending on what Taco circulator you got, there's several of them that we already have that will actually show you exactly what, hydraulically what the system is doing. However, what about just getting the concept down? If it's piped this way, then this mode is best suited for that. That's what we're going to cover uh, next week. So just a little plug on what to tune in for next week. And let's uh, let's get you comfortable with pulling these things out of the box and getting them set up in the right mood. And so uh, come join us.
Very good. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. There's a question from Omer. Omer, thank you for being with us tonight, and thank you for your note, by the way. I appreciate that. Um, will Takeo be phasing out uh, the EC, phasing out non-ECM pumps soon? I use the 0015E or 0070, but I'm wondering will the regular 0015s be phased out soon? Really good question, and the answer there is no. Uh, we're not going to be phasing these out anytime soon because uh, it's still the lion's share of the industry. I mean, that's when we sell just a ton of these things uh, uh, to, in, in all parts of both the U.S. and Canada. Um, the, the I think the bigger the bigger question is we you know the the Department of Energy starting in 2020 uh, instituted efficiency guidelines for larger circulators, one horsepower and above. Yeah. So any circulator sold, I think after last January 20th or 20 January 27th of 2020, had to be of a certain efficiency if they were one horsepower and above, and that dramatically impacted our commercial business in a positive way because we had all these we had all these terrific circulators, and uh, we had like five years to 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 get that to to, to reach that point. The question had always been, when will that happen for residential circulators? And I think all of us have, I, uh, I'm going to say testified before a DOE subcommittee. That sounds really fancy, but we wasn't testifying. They just called us up and asked a couple questions. But when I'm looking to impress people, I said, well, yeah, so I t testified to a subcommittee of the uh, Department of Energy Regulatory Committee. And really, it was it was two people on a call. OK, but it sounds better my way. Um, <laughs> But they were they were looking at, at making rules for regulating smaller circulators as well, the fractional horsepower circulators that we work with. That kind of has been put on put on hold over the last several years. And you know, it, originally they were talking about 2023, 2024. I'm going to guess it might be out even further now, if it's even on if it's even on the the, the horizon. Um, yeah, I think it'll eventually happen and you won't be able to buy those anymore, but we'll make them right up until they say don't buy them. We're selling more ECM circulators now. On the on, on the other hand, we're selling more ECM circulators now than we did a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. Because yeah, it's going up. It, yeah. yeah, it's going up. And and the other thing is the the, the other pumps aren't going down. <laughs> OK, no, the, the AC yeah. circulators are going up as well as but not at the same trajectory as the as the ECM circulators. So. They're not going to go away. They're they're just not because you know they people still buy them. In a lot of cases, it's a price thing. Yeah. Uh, you'll see in areas like the here in the Northeast, um, where utility companies give rather substantial uh, energy efficiency rebates for using an ECM circulator instead of a standard efficiency circulator. So they're buying efficiency, if you will. Yeah. And we see that in the New England states and other other areas have have uh, varying programs to encourage energy efficiency uh, in, in in circulators, in blower motors, on furnaces, you name it. They're all out there. Uh, and those those, you know, when those stop, you know, when when they're in place and a 007 E is less expensive than a 007, well, people <laughs> are putting in the 007 E right when on. that starts to go away. Boom, it, it, it almost immediately switches and then they institute it again and it does this. So it's an interesting dynamic. It's yeah. a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. So, but again, the thing about the, the, the thing about ECM circulators, and I, Rick will go over this next week, oh. is it, it really, a lot of the stuff we talked about both last week and this week, they opened the door for knowledge for the, the hydronics industry and really understanding how how significant of a problem residential overpumping is. We never really thought about it before the advent of ECM circulators because we really had no way of addressing it. If you had a 007 and that's what you put in, well, that's what you put in and yeah. the system did what the system did, right? Uh, but once you had the ability to vary the speed of the circulator, both, especially with a delta T circulator, less so with delta P, but especially with delta T, we had the ability to match the flow to the load a lot better. And we started to see some really amazing things. I don't know if Anthony Reichow is still on the call, but he put in a delta T circulator in his house in Philadelphia, a relatively small house. And it was one circulator and I think three zones of baseball or three zones on, on zone pals. And he found in a, I think it was a 30% colder winter 
he used 20% less fuel oil than the year before. Nice. Which is remarkable. And what he said was the thing didn't fire. The boiler, I was able to satisfy the call for heat sometimes just using the residual heat in the boiler. That's didn't even awesome. fire sometimes. And when, when it did, it fired for a nice long time. That was just light bulbs went off. I said, that's how it's supposed to be. That's yeah. how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Sorry, I was on a roll. Go ahead. Rolling, baby. Yeah. Forget it. He's rolling, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody Jeremy's said we're competitive. Bob armor. says we're competitive with our ECMs. That's great. Yeah, we are. You know, we're trying to get people to understand that uh, just just get used to everything that comes with an ECM. You'll never go back. You know, there's plenty of people that decided not. I know I'm talking to a lot of people out in the East Coast, but there's plenty of people that have decided that uh, a long time ago that they weren't putting in cast iron boilers anymore just because of all the advantages that the mod cons brought, whether they're floor mounted or wall mounted or whatever. There's a bunch of advantages. Uh, and, and, and I understand in the oil markets, hey, you're still using cast iron. It makes total sense. But, uh, uh, um, you know, if you understand all the reasons why you would use a modulating condensing piece of equipment and the advantages that has over traditional uh, equipment, then that, though, we're after you to understand how much better an ECM is than a standard efficiency ECM or a fixed speed pump. So anyway. We'll get into all that next week, so please join us March third. March third, yes, sir. I remember when remember when ECM first came out, and uh, there were people. I, I, it was all over the wall. People were saying, "Oh, these things are going to save an un unbelievable amount of electricity. It's gonna you're going to cut a customer's electric bill. It's like wow." And then I remember writing a white paper back about that. And it just people went, people lost their minds. Yeah. Because I said, you know what? Let's do the math here, people. And the math says there are maybe a lot of really good reasons to use variable speed and ECM, but electrical savings is nice. It's not life changing. It's nice. Yeah. You know, it basically, we I did the math in one example, and it came out to about three bucks a month. <laughs> and I can remember people losing their mind over that and get given calling me every name in the book and i said yeah but you haven't disputed the math have you done the math yeah. it's very easy to do once you do the math you realize that the electrical savings aren't going to change anyone's life what the electrical savings do is they tell you that the customer is going to be paying for this ecm circulator anyway whether you give it to them or not right if you don't give it to them, they're going to pay for it forever, right? Because their electric bills will be higher. And within two or three years, the what they say would have would have offset the higher purchase price if there was one, right? Uh, and if they do get it, well, they they start they 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 get it and they you have lower, slightly lower electric bills right away. Three, four bucks a month. It just depends on what what your electric rates are and how long it runs. So it's interesting. To, it's an interesting way to look at it. I, I think that I tell people all the time, your customers buying this thing anyway. It's just a matter of whether you give it to them or not. Well, when's it going to pay for itself? Never. It's never going to pay for itself. That's not the point. The only the only way a circulator will ever pay for itself is if it gets a job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If it goes out and delivers papers, I don't know. Nobody delivers papers anymore. But you know what I mean. If it, it yeah. if it if it, it if it gets an Uber route, okay, then it might pay for itself. They don't pay for themselves. Nothing pays for themselves. They it, it's an appliance. No one asks when is the microwave going to pay for itself. It's the same thing, only different. Right? It's providing you comfort, but it's also really managing the overall effectiveness and efficiency of your system. So, a lot of lot of lot of things there, and the cost of home ownership, absolutely. Oh, I Christopher had a has one. Christopher is saying, what are the life expectancies on an ECM? He's referencing a 007E, but engineering has told us that we could expect double the life 
based on a standard permanent split capacitor motor pumps. And we've got Taco 007s that have been out there 30, 40 years working, right? Mm -hmm. So they're saying that the ECM and the amount of, uh, the, the way that it runs different, it runs cooler, it, it runs at higher RPMs, but it runs cooler based on uh, the DC motor inside, the permanent magnet and everything. They're saying potentially double the life expense, uh, expectancy of a standard efficiency circulator. So hopefully that gives you an idea of another reason why to consider these things as well. So. Okay. Or Bill's question right way. after that was a good Bill's yeah, question right after way. that was a good one is if you can change the habit of zoning with circulators and go with an ECM pump and zone valves, now the electrical savings can be pretty large. I'll go you one better there, Bill. You doesn't even have to, it doesn't have to be an ECM pump. No. <laughs> You don't have to, I mean, if you, if you went with, just think about it, five circulators versus, you know, five 007s yeah. versus one 007 and five zone valves, I've cut my electrical consumption by 80% and I haven't touched an ECM. That's right. And it's because I have 80% fewer pumps. So it's, at that point, again, the ECM doesn't enter into it. You don't have to use an ECM for zone pumping. You can use a regular 007 and you're going to get, you're going to get very, very similar reductions. So yeah, it's again one of the one of those things that when these things started to be sold, there was so much misinformation and to my opinion, nonsense about what they could do that they, they were magic. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, to 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 extend on what Rick was talking about with the life expectancy of circulators, um, the engineers design our circs to last a minimum, minimum 250,000 cycles is you know something turning on and off on and off um that's usually what they design on is, is cycle count and 250,000 cycles was a a threshold that was discussed probably 50 years ago you know when the 007 first came out um but also when you stop and think about 50 years ago how many zones did we have in our house one yeah. all right yeah. so that lasted you know it could easily last 18 to 20 years now, as we start seeing more and more zones in our houses, and if we start zoning by pump more often, we're going to shorten the lifespan of the circulators because now we're kicking on and off, on and off more often because they're much smaller zones. You go a zone valve system, all right, and circulators, you're going to get less cycles out of your circulator. So just think about it that way too when you are designing your systems. What are you looking for, all right? Is it one, the electrical savings? Well, the electrical is the electrical cost, all right? Yeah, it's something to consider for your customers because it's they're going to be paying for for the life of the system too, but also start, and it may not be that much of a difference. I know most people, when they install a system, they just say, well, I'm going to put four pumps in because, hey, it's four pumps, right? That's what I like to do, and I'm putting four pumps in, okay? Um, when we start thinking about life expectancy, that's when it starts to really come into play, and a lot of people say, well, pumps fail all the time. That's why I like to do pumps. Because if I do zone valves in one pump and that pump goes down, now I got no heat in the house. Well, the reason why the pump went down is because we're short cycling it to death. Because <laughs> it's in a zone pump style system. Because they, they're working off of experience. And I got no problems with that theory. You think about it that way, but now you got to look at it from the other side. The reason why you see lots of zone pumps that died is because it was in a zone pump system. In a zone valve system, your circs are going to last much longer. Now, granted, if you've got systems, you know, if your customer is an hour and a half, two hours away, and you need the reliability of zone pumps out there so they have heat in the other parts of the house, then yes. All right, but um, but think about the, the cycle count that you're putting through the circulators too. Sorry, rant over. Terry Turner, just... has, Terry Turner has, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm, I'm talking over you, I'm sorry. Terry Turner has a very good uh, point. Uh, ex excellent reliability from ECM blower motors for over 25 years, right? Yeah. And here's the thing well, about an EC ECM technology, it's not new. ECM technology has been around since 1969. General Electric came up with the first electronically commutated motor way back then. This is not new technology or experimental stuff. This stuff's been around for a long, long time. In fact, uh, Taco Italia, our Italian brothers, our Italian family, um, they actually introduced the first residential ECM variable speed circulator in the world in 1999-2000. Uh, they were not part of Taco at that time. They were part of a company called Ascol, 
uh, Taco purchased the pump, the circulator manufacturing division of Ascol back in 2015, 2016, thereabouts. Uh, so that's uh, that's our, how far back our technology goes, even though it wasn't our technology specifically back then. But uh, that's uh, that's you know our our kind of lineage as far as that that goes. Um, yeah. Interesting question about if you were to keep one one truck one SKU on your truck for ECM circulators, what model would it be for non-commercial? And I see Rick had mentioned something about the 0018E. I think that's a really good really good choice because you have infinitely adjustable fixed speed, right? You have proportional pressure for those weird times you might need proportional pressure. You have uh, uh, using the Bluetooth app, you have nine constant pressure curve settings, all right? And so you have a lot of different different uh, 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 functionality there, and you can connect it to the Bluetooth, via Bluetooth to the app on your phone and get diagnostics and get all kinds of really cool stuff. That would be, you know, kind of the the the, the Cadillac choice to keep on your on your truck for service. It, depending upon if you have a wide variety of, job, of jobs and installs that you service. Do you have some panel radiators with, with thermostatic radiator valves? Do you have some cast iron radiation? Do you have single zones? Do you have zone pumps? Do you have zone valves? It's kind of a workhorse for all of those. Uh, if you don't really deal with, if you don't deal with uh, anything where you might need proportional pressure uh, for a pump that's small, you might, you might look at the 0015 E3. It's a three setting, pretty versatile pump, five foot ahead, 10 foot ahead, constant pressure settings, or fixed speed, full speed. Uh, you can use Delta P as a zone pump and it'll find its happy spot whether you pick five foot or 10 foot ahead. It's just a matter of which one's the right one for that application. So I, it, it's a toss up, I'd say either one. And then Rick, you said, you know, if you go from the 0018E up to the 0034E, you cover a pretty wide range. Yeah, 120 circulators. How would you like to have two SKUs on your truck and cover 120 pumps that are out there as competitors, as well as Taco uh, uh, replacements? So it, it it's, it's phenomenal what ECM technology is doing for us. So you folks, all the more reason to consider. Very good. Oh, Very half, good. The other half of which one you would keep on the truck is you forgot to mention the universal flange too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Yes. Yeah, you, so you ding, got ding, it ding, we have a winner. And you'll never have to worry about what the orientation is and never touch a flange that's been there for a long time. Yeah, that's right. Right. Very good. Very good point. Very good point. And the follow-up was the, what's the plus on the 0034E? Okay. Rick, what's the, the plus well, part on the 0034E? It's, it's, it's the way that the human gets to interface with the pump. Now, we, we've got some buttons and we have digital readouts that we can see what's going on. We can actually set the circulator up so we can ultimately get to see the flow and the head. Those are the two things that we use to size a pump. That, that's what anybody that walks into a job should have some idea of what that means and now we actually get to show you what it's doing in the 0018e we actually get to see a live operating point with the 0034e we actually get to read it in a digital format so very good very good uh let's see do 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 do, do. what do we have here at the point two to three hour away job uh, two ECMs in parallel tell me and tell the customer to only turn the other one on if the first one fails. All right, yeah, if you got if you have a zone valve job and you want if it's way the heck away, yeah, put in two pumps. This one's a spare in just yeah. in case. Sure, yeah. why not? You can why do not? it. Yeah, how many boilers are you putting in? I'm calling. <laughs> just asking because that one boiler goes down, don't they want an extra one? Because uh, I'm just saying, yeah. saying, redundancy means redundancy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. I guess John and I are on the same thoughts there because I just typed all of that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> ah, very good, very good. I, I think we've been hanging out together way too much. So way too long, way yes. too long. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh, one other thing I love about the 0018E is seeing the runtime and shutdown, so I can see. Yeah. The runtime on a cycles. specific zone, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you the total runtime and the total number of cycles. And you can do, if you go back and check, you can actually do a little bit of math there and say, hey, I may, maybe I don't have this thing set up right because that's an awful lot of cycles. Yeah. 
for that amount of runtime. Maybe I've over, maybe I can bump, bump this thing down a little bit and see if I can even that out a little bit. So that's what that's what data gives you. That's the cool thing about data. You know, that could tell you uh, your uh, reset curve is set a little high too. You know, yeah, that's right. Get that reset right. curve back where it belongs. You'll get a longer runtime. So. Very good. There you go. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. I, oh, I like this from Bob. We don't carry the 0018E, but we but we will by next week. <laughs> All right. Vir virtual hug coming your way, Bob. Virtual baby. hug, baby. <laughs> All right. And I got it. I, 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 you guys are. I'm wearing the 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 Takeo After Dark T-shirt. I don't know if we went over that. You know, we oh. got the. These guys got the Takeo After Dark polos, but I got the Takeo After Dark T-shirt. All right. So it's got. Whoop, whoop. Wrong here. Here we go. Yeah. Takeo over here. We got Takeo After Dark here, and. Look at that. That's the billboard. That's I love it. that. I can't wait to get That's mine. It. That's it. should be there anytime. And we're working on Takeo After Dark jockey shorts. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, if you don't have the Wi-Fi getting to the boiler to the walls, would the pump Bluetooth work? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay. It, it, yeah, because it's the Bluetooth is just when you're standing in front of the pump. It's it's like line of sight, thirty feet. So the pump will keep working when you walk away. It does. It doesn't need you there. It's the interface for the Bluetooth in the pump is just you standing in front of it, making changes. You know, it's two way communication. You walk away. It's on its own. It doesn't need you. It's not going to freak out or do anything. So hopefully, yeah, that, so it's not that a... answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a Wi-Fi pump. It's not going online. Yeah. You're not uh, yeah. pairing it with your phone or anything like that. It is a it is a one-time handshake. Yeah. All right. At the time, so when you have the 18E in there, um, it's only uh, a one-time handshake. You can set up. You can talk to it. Uh, you can do what you need to it, and then you're done. So, um, so yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. Even if your phone has Wi-Fi, there is no password. Homeowners can jump in if they want to. All right, so but here's what's interesting about it. Yeah, you get a printout. Show them, Dave. So when you have when you have a 0018, um, if the homeowner wanted to download the app and connect to the circulator, they can. Yeah. You know why? Because it's, it's theirs. theirs. It's, it's theirs. theirs. They device, own it. <laughs> right? It's theirs. But if they were to connect to it, they can't do anything. They can just see what it does. They can't change any settings. They would have to know going to downstairs and they would have to touch the dial and then move it back again in order to make it two-way yeah, communication. Wake it up. Yep. Yeah, you're only going to get one-way communication. You don't get two-way communication uh, with the circulator. The only way you get two-way communication is when you are setting it up downstairs. So I've just got mine. Uh, I just started up right now. And where's my scoop out? So now it's up and running, and I'm going to turn the dial and put it into the Bluetooth mode. So now it's in Bluetooth, and if I were to start my app on my phone, I am then going to be able to communicate to it. So it's looking for a circulator to communicate to. Let me zoom out. Pull it back a little bit. Yeah, it's, you yeah, got to get I'm getting the reflections of you yeah, guys. I'm yeah. seeing me. <laughs> yes. And I click on it and that and if you see the light flashing, see the light flashing on the circ? That means yeah. I just communicated. Well, no, I was hiding. I was oh, showing okay. you the circ. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the light was flashing on the circ. That means I just commit I just created a handshake. So now I'm talking to it. And now I can change any of the settings that I want on this circulator by using my app. And my circulator is going to speed up and down. And I'm going to try and keep it so you guys can see. So if I were to change the speed, see the light flash on the circulator? And it just means it dropped down to this lower speed now. Yeah. Or I can come to the top and change which mode the circulator is going to run in. And it's going to it's going to a change affect it right away. But this is only because I have put it, I put it into mode. the Bluetooth mode. Yeah. In 30 minutes, if I leave this running, it just goes into read only yeah. where I can't change any settings. All I can do is look at funny pictures. Yeah. 
and that's it. So we're not going to make this thing going online. It's just it's just Bluetooth. My point, just Dave, is a service tech could print out and take pictures of what the operating point was, and he has it in his hand. He comes back a year later, and it's all messed up, so to speak. He could say, "No, no, this is where I left it. You must have changed it." it, it yeah, it gives you something to say. Look, it's on paper. This is what happened. And I'll be glad to fix it for you, and I'll also pay, you'll have to write me a check for doing it. Right. Yeah, because so, you can have that. The, the app will create a report. Yes. And it will give you a report of the of the operating mode in which you left it. So can you go yeah. back? They call you back a year later and say, "Oh, this thing's all messed up. I don't know what's going on." Uh, you can look. It's stored on your device. You can look at your phone. When was the last time I was here? Here's where it was. This is where I left it, Mrs. Johnson. Here's where it is. How did hey, how on earth lady. could that have happened? Well, uh, they, they thought my husband thought he could make it better. I said, okay, well, I'll fix it. I'll be happy to put it back there. But you know, the, the clock the clock is ticking. Yep. So um, I know a couple of questions came in. Do we have that on the Delta T or do we have that on the 34E where you can get reports on that? Not yet. Not yet. Yet. Right. So we had the 34E in development as well as the 18E at the same time by two different groups of engineers. And so the 18E came out first, but we were too far ahead with the 34E and we wanted to get that out to you guys. So um, will we have Bluetooth in future versions of circulators? I would say yes. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we'll have it, you know, but right now the only one that has it is the 0018E. Okay. Got to start somewhere. Yep. Very good. You put that info in with the combustion analysis results. There yeah, you go. As a yeah, separate what, report. Yeah. 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 What you can do is you can like as Rick said, you can either print out that report or email it. You can it's a totally exportable report. You can email it to the homeowner, you can email it to the shop, you know, print it out, keep it in a folder, whatever you need to do to 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 to, to keep that file and then it's always there and it's all and it will be on your device as well. It's stored not on the cloud, but it's stored in your device. So uh, a question came in a little while ago. Um, any issues with cast piping and boilers and the really ECM circs, or are really mag separators necessary? So, uh, so Bob, I, I, um, if you ha if you didn't make it to first, uh, um, bleh, the first winter first winter essentials class where I went through mag and dirt and air separators, um, do you need a mag separator for the circulator? No. Yeah. Not ours. Not ours. Not ours. Yeah. It's good for the boiler and for the system, but not necessarily for the Taco ECM circulators. So I'm going to show you. I've got it right here. Uh, take it apart. We have what we call a bio barrier. It's this is not a filter. It's a barrier. It prevents the rust, any rust from getting in to the magnet itself. So the water that comes in, this is sitting in water, but water doesn't flow in and out. It prevents any of the rust that's in the water from passing through that filter, that barrier, and getting to the magnet itself. So, no, it's not necessary for our circs, but it would be, if you think you've got issues, consider it for your boiler and the, and the, high, and the connected load is probably better than it is for necessary for the circulator. So, yeah, right. however, if you use something that's not a green ECM circulator like ours with letter T on top of it, then you might need one. Yeah, that's something that is unique to to the the Taco circulator specifically because these were designed for the American marketplace, and we've been we've been making circulators for the American marketplace for many 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 decades, and we know all of the crazy things that can happen in in these systems with with crappy crappy water, magnetic junk in the water, etc. That 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 are the kryptonite for any wet rotor circulator. We've been dealing with that longer than anybody, so between the bio barrier, which makes the magnet essentially invisible to the magnetic crud that's in the water, so they just never go, it never goes in there. We have the shore start function, which Dave showed earlier uh, a couple of weeks ago as well, where if for any reason that, that rotor gets locked up, it'll go into an auto unlock mode and shake it back and forth so it will break itself free uh it, to, to the point where it, it's just it's it's almost bulletproof in that in that condition now we're, the takeo circulators is not not mean to be a sales presentation but the takeo circulators are the only ones in the business that have those two that have not just both of those things but have either of those two things 
So from our standpoint, a dirt mag separator is not at all necessary for our circulators. All right. There are advantages to having it for the boiler protection, absolutely, and for the system. But as far as the circulators are concerned, we do not require them. He said, as a hush fell over the pool room. Yeah. <laughs> they come walking in on, off the street. But the cost of installing a dirt mag is cheaper than coming back to do a failed pump or boiler. I, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yes. Boilers, heat exchangers, a lot more money than a circulator most of the yep. time. Yep. I would. Uh, I mean, for me, we we sell a dirt mag separator, a really nice, simple one yeah. for, for boilers. Absolutely. I it, it, absolutely put it in. Not necessary for our circulator, though. But if you have it in, you have it in. So it's not a bad thing. Well, we take out the big chunks, and big chunks is down to 40 microns. 40 microns, folks, is the size of pollen floating around, getting in your eyes and in your nose and stuff. So, uh, again, are there part? Is there particulate less than 40 microns? Yes. Could it possibly get into the magnet? Yes. But then, as John has already said, we got the ability. If that were to lock us up, we have the ability to shake ourselves loose and keep going. So uh, again, people have taken our pumps apart and had b a bio in there, but it's it's this really really small stuff where we take out the big chunks. We do a really good job. The good thing, you talk to our reps all around North America, and you don't have a big bone pile pallet full of old uh, failed Taco ECM products. The good thing is these things work. They just keep working. It's the design. Very good. And Dan Cook, the boiler man, says, yes, please protect your boilers. Nothing no, nothing worse than a contractor not cleaning or protecting the system. Water to protect the entire system. Absolutely. Yes. And we did a go back to if you go back on YouTube, uh, Takeo's YouTube channel or Mechanical Hub's YouTube channel and go back to last summer, Takeo After Dark's uh, last uh, the summer series last summer. We had a presentation with Patrick S, E-S-S, -S, Patrick S from Mondale and Associates, who is the Takeo rep in Minnesota, but they are also, uh, they also rep Fernox. And Patrick we invited on because Patrick is, is, not, is one of the most knowledgeable water treatment experts I've ever met. And he did a beautiful presentation on, on the finer points of water treatment, how it works, why it works, uh, the, the advantages of it, how it can be done very easily. Uh, it, 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 it's worth your time if you go on, uh, go on YouTube and look that sucker up. Um, it's worth your time. It really is. It, it, it's, he, he is he's a, just a fascinating guy, a very enthusiastic speaker, and he really breaks it down in a very, very positive and very, very easy to understand way. So uh, definitely, worth, de definitely worth going back and taking a listen to. Uh, John uh, Freelich, uh, you had a double OE series. I'm assuming that's a one of our big, what we call our big VR series. The big VR series, which is um, 3452s, uh, uh, the 15 through 30 VR, 15 through 30, up to three inch pumps. Those don't have a bio barrier in them. So just clarifying that. So yeah, it wasn't one of those there, John. So. Um, yeah, it's just the smaller six and three eighths, six and a half inch flange to flange dimension that's going to have that um, that bio barrier built built into there. The larger yeah. ones do not have that. Yeah. Um, but uh, Rick, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, 26E and 34E had the bio barrier. Yes. Okay. The only one that won't is um, something that's not released yet. Uh, we're, we're about to expand the the 44 watt, the little pump in stainless steel. So we have about six more units coming out. And because they're particularly meant to be used in domestic hot water applications, they chose to keep the bio barrier out of those. But everything else pretty much has it in there. So. Yeah, but it still has those. Still will have the sure start in the air. Yes, so. has sure start. It yeah, sees the air. It, the it has all that stuff in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, meant in an open system, so you're not going to have rust. It's usually a flow-through style system, so yeah. 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 Nothing to rust out in those jobs if you have to use a stainless steel later. Yeah, yeah. Very Excellent. good. All right. Ooh.
This was this has been good. Down. And again, did I say that, Dave? I think everybody's slowing down a little bit. I'm not sure. <laughs> I know we're two and a half hours in our again. <laughs> Another two and a half hours, and we still have 80 people out there. So this Zach's is really cool. looking for a 009. That's our uh, old pump. You know, uh, it's got a curve that looks like this. It's almost vertical. He's wanting to know if we're going to have that in the ECM version. And, and uh, oh, I don't think it'll so. It'll be a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 009 is a weird pump, and it's yeah. it was really intended for some very specific uses. The, one of them was as a booster pump for drain back, uh, excuse me, drain, drain, try that again. Say it again. Drain back solar systems. That's an open system, right? And it, what you would do there is you'd, it, that's one time you'd have to factor in the lift. You had yeah. your regular solar pump that would run the solar system, but the 009 was a booster pump to fill the drain back solar panel, go over the top and fill up the drain back tank to complete yeah. the to make it a completely closed circuit and once that's done the 009 would shut off and then the regular solar pump would take over that's really the the one of the key uses for it because it's such a low low flow super high head very rarely would you put that in a house i i, I just i can't uh, uh, for for regular pumping pro, uh, process my wife is accusing me of watching <laughs> I, I was laughing at that earlier. That's funny. Uh, back to water quality. What effect, if any, does it have on the impellers? In these circulators, the impellers are a composite material, so so none really. Very 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 little, if any, uh, effect on the impellers themselves. And really, on on even on larger circulators with brass impellers, they're pretty beefy. They're pretty beefy. I would say maybe sometimes the water chemistry could affect any of the plastics when you start getting really high basic or really high pH or or low pH. Um, you could, but then you've got way other issues going on. Yeah. Uh, John John Freeling's telling us it was a it was a VT twenty two eighteen where he had that issue, and I think we had a, a different early design. early ones. You had a yeah we had a different uh, bio barrier in that, so that that it, it could have been one of those instances. Sure, I would think yep. so. So hopefully we took care of that for you, John. And if not, contact one of us and we'll see what we can do. There you go. Is it? It, it is weird, but guys using it on DHW research are not great at purging the system. Yes, sir, you're yeah. right. That's one of the one of the things you all we always hear about. Well, this pump burned out. Well, what happened? Well, it got airbound in a DHW system and it wasn't doing anything, and that's how it burned out. So yeah, that is a function of purging. That here's here's one that Bob Clark's asking that that actually we have an advantage, not we, but everybody that uses ECM. And ECM um, actually converts the power, right? It brings AC. You know, we we bring power to the pump or plug it in with AC, but it does a conversion, and that does give somewhat of a buffering effect as the power, you know, wanes. Okay, we get a brownout situation or a little bit of bump in there. Uh, the whole DC uh, conversion actually helps that. We're not as affected uh, by power brownouts or spikes as a regular AC circulator would be. Hopefully that answers that question, Bob. Yeah, yeah so compared to ECM blower motors, it was such much lower voltage too or lower, lower yeah. amperage, I think that would make yeah. a difference as well. Yeah, well, you you take a look at our ECM circulator now. So here's the entire, you know, right here is the casing, all right? From here, this black stripe, that's your motor. Yep. Inside the green part here is a circuit board, all right? And so the circuitry is what's really controlling everything coming down into the motor itself. So the motor is much smaller, and the circuit board is going to be that protection, so to speak, Um from any of the fluctuations that we have going on there. And it can handle quite a wide range of fluctuations uh, built into that circ. John, I just read John's comment there about uh, just some red tape. Yeah, yeah. John, email one of us and uh, let's see if we can grease some skids and get this taken care of. That's just, I mean, if there's red tape, we can, there's always a way around that. Hell, just go to the top, send it to John Barba. <laughs> Don't, don't mess with send, us, us yeah, too. And, I'm, yeah. and I'll send it downhill. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, here we go. Lots of failures of double O R pump rotors seizing ah. on outdoor boilers. Are are 0015. these misapplied? Double yeah. O R. That was the original double. That was the original double O fifteen three speed. Yeah. We called it the double O R three speed, or the double O H are actually called the double O R for a radiant pump. The single speed double O H were called that for because it really it, those curves really do apply to radiant it's, it, very very well. Um, outdoor wood boilers are they misapplied? Absolutely. An outdoor wood boiler is an open system. You must have a stainless steel flute. It must be a designed for an open system. All right. Yeah. It's got to be an all bronze or stainless steel circulator. You put a cast iron circulator in there. It is a sacrificial anode rod. You will be replacing them with great regularity. That's just that's the reality. It's just John, the way it is. Generally speaking, they are open systems, but there are a few that are closed. So we just want to clarify that, Ron, is that most of those uh, wood boilers are open systems. You might look and see which one you have and make sure. So. And and I, I would also venture to say with a 00R or 008 or 0015, and it is an open system, it's not even just the um, cast iron portion of it that is being misapplied, but you know, on those systems, you're looking for a high flow, low head. And if yeah. it's an open system, you may not have enough static head right. on the suction side of the circulator where you're going to kill some things too. Yeah. So, that comes up. Um, yeah. and it could also be where it's installed. You know, you want any circulator that's on an open system needs to have as much water above it as possible to mm -hmm. give you static weight going down. So if sometimes it needs uh, digging a trench and putting the pump in the, in the ground uh, in order to get some static on top of it in order for it to circulate properly um, could also be the issue. I run into that a lot here on the East Coast uh, when we try to take double O circs and tie them onto steam boilers on the wet leg, uh, on a steam boiler and trying to put some, some heat on the first floor someplace. And it, a lot of times it doesn't work. It's better to do the basement space and get that pump as low as possible. You got to pipe it down and then come back up again. Um, so that happens a lot. Same idea when you're looking at these open uh, wood boilers. Dan Cook says he's going out for dinner. We'll see you next week. All right, Dan, have a good week. And uh, I, what, where, what's the ice cream of the evening? Are we still doing that? Do you do that? In the, do, do you do that in the winter time, Dan? Do we have? Do we? Is there going to be ice cream tonight? That's what I want to know. Yeah, share it with us. Yeah, and that's yeah, it. Bubbles, you see, bubbles, Rogers. I think. Rogers. Yeah, I believe it's Bubbles is the ice cream shop. So if Bubbles is still open in the winter, not sure. Mm -hmm. Or even is Bubbles open during COVID right now? So. Uh, we got a Delta question T, from Roger. Yeah, Delta T is important regardless of the weather. It it just what we're trying to do is get the pump to operate at a, you know, so that the temperature differential across the system is ideal on all situations. Uh, again, unless you've got a pump that's gonna automatically vary at speed, you're using a fixed speed pump. And as it warms up, that Delta T is gonna tighten. There's, no, you know, if I don't have much of a load, then the Delta T will tighten. There's really no way around that. So if I'm okay, understanding I've, that right, so. yeah. I, I, I remember sitting in on a webinar where someone was trying to, again, they were kind of an anti-Delta T pumping kind of a, an approach. And they were saying, well, you know, you want the Delta, the Delta T needs to get tighter as it gets warmer up. So we'll get heat out of a, out of the, out of a heat emitter. I said, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> that no. May, I mean, we want to make sure we get more heat out of a heat emitter with a higher average water temperature, because when the Delta T narrows up, the average water temperature is going to be a little bit higher. So yeah. we're going to do that so we get more output out of a foot of baseboard or whatever when it's warm out. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just I don't understand it. But that was the point. I said, no, it has to do that. And I said, no, it doesn't have to do that in order to work. It does that because we have a higher flow rate compared to the to the load. We're not taking as many BTUs out of the water, so of course the delta T is going to get snugger. But I, and Dan, Dan is going to have mint chocolate chip tonight. Thank you, Dan. Good, <laughs> good, a good choice. Quick, quick. I just want to pull you guys. Favorite ice cream, Dave? What's your favorite ice cream? Oh, me. Uh, it's got to be a Rocky Road. Rocky Road. Good call. Rocky good Road. Call. Yep. Rick. Jamocha almond fudge. <laughs> Very eclectic, but I, from you, I expect nothing less. <laughs> Very eclectic. Nice. 
For me, it's anything with peanut butter. Yeah. Cool. I don't care. I you any well without peanut butter, I'll go pistachio. Okay. Yeah. I like maple walnut. But you put you put peanut butter on any of those, I'm, I'm all over it. You put peanut butter on anything. You put peanut butter on a shoe, and I'm all over it. Just saying. Briar's oh, all natural vanilla. Not a bad call, Bob. Not a bad call. Will's got a, a big 2400, uh, a 70, and some issues there. Will, uh, again, uh, on depending on fluid quality, depending on application, uh, depending on sizing based on what that job actually needed and what pump was put in there. That might be something you want to run by your local uh, wholesaler slash uh, rep. And uh, let's see if you've had one uh, go out on you, then we need to have a look at that pump and uh, probably give you a, a feed, some feedback on what we think might have caused that issue. So. You know, 20, yeah, seals on 2400s, they can be, you know, it depends on the, on the, you know, the water quality does play a role. That's definitely does. Play Absolutely. A role. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and water quality is one water chemistry, uh, any chemicals that are being added to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, a 2400 is not a wet rotor circulator. Right. All right. It's a direct coupled circulator. And basically what happens is it's a, the seal that you have in the system. And what you have is, is two, two surfaces that are spinning like this what is what creates the seal and it's actually got a taper to it so where it allows water to come in one side and basically that's what's lubricating the two seals and if you've got some chemistry any chemicals or, or some things that are in the water itself can actually mar those surfaces so there are some chemicals that get added to the system that coat surfaces to prevent any inhibitors uh, to prevent rusting that is something that's going to coat those two surfaces that happen in there. So that ends up uh, happening quite often. And you end up pulling a circ out and you put something else, another brand in there, and it doesn't have that issue. Well, that's because those surfaces didn't get coated with that, what, that, with that chemical that was added to the water itself. And now everything is fine. And so everybody turns around and says, oh, that pump is crap. Um, so um May need to check on what you've got. I see, Will, you put some Fernux in there, so we may have to double check and see what's going on there. If you had two circs at one time, I would say the best thing is to try to hook up with the local rep in the area. Uh, if you're not sure who that is, uh, get in contact with one of us. Take a look at the Takeo app. It actually can do a search for you sure. uh, for your uh, for your rep out there. Yeah. I will uh, I will send you my email if you're not sure who your rep is. Richard Summers says, have you ever had peanut butter with blue cheese? <laughs> no. How about, how about bacon and ice cream? But, That's but I want to. Peanut, how do you do peanut butter and blue cheese? Hit, hit, Richard, tell, details, baby, details. Peanut butter and blue cheese on bread. So it's a peanut butter. Throw some blue cheese on there. Not gorgonzola, blue cheese. And make it a sandwich. Hmm. John, you can't or, have cheese, can you? I can. I, I got it. I got I'm an email. Talking. I'm vegetarian. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. I got an email earlier today I, that we should probably consider doing a a takeaway after dark cooking class because who knows? We always end up starting to turn back to food here and there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I get it's a big big takeaway after dark goes to Flavor Town. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna bleach my hair. Yep. It, it, it's an empty gesture, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna bleach everything up. I'm gonna get all tatted. I could you know? I could bleach my hair and give it give it the little guy look. Well, not there really. Never mind. It's it's a that's an empty gesture too. <laughs> Dave and I spent a uh, back when we could travel and we would travel together on occasion. We spent <clears throat> several weeks hitting as many diners, drive-ins, and dives as we could. There were a bunch in Rhode Island and southeastern Mass, and we went to other places too, didn't we? Um, I well, then we started doing it on our own. Yeah, you know, so then I, and then we were texting each other once. Hey, look at this! I'm in I'm in Jersey. I'm at another one. So yep. yeah, the triple yep. D joints. Oh yes. yeah. When I lived in Minnesota, there were several in Minnesota that it would hit. Um, been to a few others. Haven't been haven't been to one in a while. 
I haven't been to one in a while. No. I haven't been out much. I haven't been to a restaurant in a while either. So yeah, there's that too. We go, a lot yeah. of takeout, man. A lot of takeout. Well, I, I realize why Guy has uh, quite a few shows in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. His wife That's is from Rhode Island. Island. His wife is from here. Yeah, he's from yeah. California, and the wife is from here. So any chance he has to come back and 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 be with the in-laws, you know, he does it through work. Kind of yeah. let work pick the bill. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> why not? All right. Okay, well, we're down to uh, six, uh, less than 70 people. I think we, it might be a good time for us to say, hey, now that we've we've devolved into talking about diners, drive-ins, and dives, and dyeing our hair, and eating peanut butter and blue cheese sandwiches. Blue cheese, yes, blue cheese. It might be time for the old the, to take a look at the old clock on the wall and see if it's time to say so long for another edition of Takeo After Dark. Uh so uh, last call for questions, guys. Anything you got still sitting out there, now's the time to shoot it out. Otherwise, we will probably have to say Zip so it. long. All righty. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate it. Abdelaziz, thank you very much. Will, Richard, very good. I am go I am going to go buy – we got peanut butter. I am going to go buy some blue cheese, man. I am going to try that. <laughs> Oh, Toast man. any kind of bread. What kind of bread, Richard? Real quick, does it does the type of bread matter? Dave's killer it, bread. I would think it might. White bread, so like like Wonder Bread kind of white bread. Okay, oh. all right, very good. Oh wait, John had to come back. John's not going to let us go just yet. All right, good question, John. <laughs> I saw this earlier. We didn't answer that. Is using a Delta T pump with a mod con on the primary side going to cause issues? Well, Meaning, no. Are you using it as a boiler pump or the heating system pump, John? That's I the think question. It's a boiler pump. Boiler, a boiler pump. pump. Yeah, boiler Before pump. I, yeah, I mean, I I did it for six seasons, John. Had no issues whatsoever. So it kind of depends on uh, how you set it up. But there's nothing fighting anything else. I mean, all the 2218s doing is looking at when you power it up. It's looking at supply and return temperature. If you're okay when you first start it up, it kind of eases its way up in speed. Okay. If all of a sudden it gets wide, it it gets it wakes itself up and goes right to spinning up to keep your delta T. On a modcon application, I'd probably start at a 30. If your manufacturer would let you go out to 35 or 40, I might even do that. Uh, but the boiler's looking at uh, when it gets a call for heat, it typically does this. It looks at on a central heating call, which is what you're saying here. It looks at the outdoor temperature and it says, okay, what should my supply water temperature be? And it says, okay, let's fire up. And it's got PID logic. It sees how far away it is, how long that's been, how quickly it's approaching and all that good stuff. And it fires accordingly. It doesn't know anything about how much flow is going through its heat exchanger except what the delta t is across the heat exchanger and as long as a pump is moving fluid through there appropriately right it's never going to get too wide and the boiler never going to know the difference so again i've i've witnessed i've lived with that that scenario that you're bringing up right there and uh, it's worked flawlessly for six seasons. Uh, it's on its six season now. I just sold the house just a couple months ago, but um, the people have my cell phone number. If there's ever anything, <laughs> I'm going to hear about it. So uh, anyway, uh, hopefully that answers your question. And to, just to back that up, what about the boiler manufacturers that already have the same technology in that what they do is they take a zero to 10 signal, send it to the boiler circulator, and they base the pump speed on the delta T setting that you set up in the boiler manufacturer. For instance, if they say, if it comes out of the box at 30, then they're gonna spin the pump up and down with a zero to 10 signal to give you the delta T that you want across that boiler's heat exchanger. Remember, boilers don't have flow reading devices in it. They don't know that what the actual flow rate through the heat exchanger is, but they do know if the delta T ever exceeds a certain number, it's about 25C or 45F, then that's about the only time they ever get excited. So again, keep it keep it at 30, 35, whatever the boiler manufacturer will let you go out to, and you should see no issues whatsoever. That's been my experience. Very I good. Will, I, will, I will add one thing to that though. Um, 
there are some boiler manufacturers that will say that you don't need to do the primary circulator, secondary circulator. You can do a straight through piping sure. heating system. Yeah. If you end up doing Delta T there, then you end up getting some funky stuff that can happen because it is designed as a single zone style system. If you do multiple zones after that with one pump, then I have run into issues where it doesn't work. And, and the analogy that I have now is you've got um, one car, two drivers, right? The boiler starts to modulate and then the, and then the pump modulates and they, and they end up being you know not lined up to each other. And sometimes it bangs back and forth. Will it heat the house? Sure. Um, but it's not doing what you want it to do too. So I've run into that situation on a couple of boiler applications. But if you go ahead and do it with a primary secondary, Rick has got a puzzled look on his face. Well, no, I just I'm saying based on what we were just talking about, how was it piped? In and out. He, he said boiler pump. Oh no, no, I agree. Yes, yeah, okay. boiler pump as 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 what John was thinking about. Yes, as a boiler pump, and then you've got secondary pumps. But if you didn't do the boiler pump and secondary pumps. You just did an in out. Yep. There's yep. a couple of boiler manufacturers that have said, oh, you can do that if it's one zone. Yes. If you do multiple zones and now all of a sudden you get um you get the one car, two driver syndrome and it yep. goes back and forth and trying to fight. I, I each just other. I haven't experienced that, so I don't know. Yeah, I've had a couple I've had a couple of them here. It was a couple of years ago. Not many people do it anymore. Um, meaning the piping uh situations and, and those job sites. So all right, now we may be able to. Yep, this might be, I think this is a record, two hours, 45 minutes. I Oof. think this might be the longest one we've done. I think I'm sleeping in tomorrow. I think I am, I think I am too. <laughs> I highly <laughs> doubt it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, put in our, we put in our eight hours, just not like everybody else, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We're looking forward to seeing you next week. All yeah. right. Thank Todd. Appreciate you coming again. Todd Raymond, Todd Raymond, who was married to Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, right? <laughs> hey, Todd, I know you're old enough to remember that one. And uh, yeah, John Freelick says it's like a pull me, push you from Dr. Seuss. Absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely right. All right. Rick, what do we call this? Closely spaced tees. Closely spaced tees. Double thumbs up. Yeah, Thank you, everybody. Thumbs, baby. We yeah. will see you all next week. Be good. All right. Enjoy, y'all. Later.